All right, world, here we go. Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin. We got a lot to do. We got about two hours to do it. I thought, how am I gonna start this thing? I could ask you guys how you're doing. We could dive right into some deep topics. But then I thought, no, let's do something else. A lot of people don't seem to like us. <laughs> that, is, that is a weird thing. We've been bouncing around quite literally all over the world the last couple months. And we're meeting thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at this point, mm -hmm. who are decent, good people from every walk of life, trying to find some answers and meet other people that think like them or don't think like yep. them, but just, but just want to find some decency in this world. And yet the online world just seems relentlessly hateful, and you probably get more hate than anyone else. So I thought that would just be an interesting way to start this. Like, just as three people that I think are basically trying to put some decency out there, just sort of the level of anger and hate that we get. I'll, I'll go to you first. Okay, does, well, does it bother you anymore? Oh, yeah. I mean, I try to shield myself to it, from it to some degree. I mean, I've certainly decreased the amount of time that I'm spending reading Twitter comments to pretty much zero. Yeah. Um, the, I find the, uh, the contentious interchanges with journalists, I would say, are the most stressful things that I do. And they usually rattle me up for a day or two afterwards, um, even though I would say they're still worth doing. Um, but the, the, here, here's the thing. Okay, so a couple of observations. The first is a lot of the pejorative comments that have been aimed at me, for example, have been that my followers are a bunch of angry, young, white men. And so I, I'd like to take that apart a little bit. Sure. I mean, the first thing I've learned in the last month or so thought through is that I'm done making any sort of apologies whatsoever for the fact that most of the people who are watching my YouTube videos are, are men. There's nothing wrong with talking to men, and if men happen to be benefiting from what I'm discussing, then so much the better. Women have to live with men, and so that's of great benefit to women, and there are plenty of women writing me, telling me that, and also meeting me at these talks saying yeah. exactly the same thing. And then they're not angry, so and how do I know that? Well, as you just pointed out, we have spoken to 250,000 people in seven months. How many incidents of anger have we had? I mean, when I tell you literally none. Zero. Zero. Right, zero. They, they, the shows have been love fests, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, they're very, very positive. Yeah. So, and we had one heckler who was obviously not a fan in yeah. one venue. I wasn't and even at that show. You so weren't, that, so that it wasn't one, your that, fault. That one's on you, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the, the lectures couldn't possibly be more peaceful or positive, as far as I'm concerned. And so, and then the people there aren't particularly young. I would say the average age is, is somewhere between 30 and 40, mm -hmm. and there's plenty of older people. And especially in the U.S. now, it's at least a third women for what that's worth, and yeah. I think that's because women are buying more of the books. In Europe, it was still more men, but that's because in many of those countries, the book had only come out recently. Yeah. And but it's, YouTube, definitely, it's definitely not the way the media portrays it. They're making it seem like it's 90-10. I mean, I always yeah. say at the beginning of the show when I reference something about that. I usually say it's 60-40, and yep. maybe sometimes it's a little more one way or the other, but it's certainly not the way that... Well, I think trained. a lot of the vitriol is... See, I, was, I just finished reading another book on postmodernism, an Oxford book on postmodernism, and uh, on Derrida in particular, and like there really was an attempt on the part of the postmodernists, and, and this is allied, I think, with their fundamental Marxism, to demolish the idea of the autonomous individual. So, for example, one of the things that's really interesting about the current free speech debate is that it really isn't a debate because you have to be in the Judeo-Christian slash Enlightenment tradition to believe in free speech because to believe in free speech you have to believe that there are autonomous individuals who have their own viewpoints who can spontaneously generate creative ideas and then who can engage in an active dialogue in a, in a, in a manner that that, is, that consists of fundamental goodwill and truth, and that you can change each other's opinions, and that you can come to a negotiated agreement. You have to believe all of that, including mm -hmm. the autonomous individual, in that concept, the logos, which is what Der Derrida was so, so uh, what he criticized so heavily, that idea of lo logocentrism. You have to believe in the autonomous individual. And the postmodernist and the neo-Marxists, they don't. They believe that the individual is a mouthpiece for a power assembly. Mm -hmm. And that there's no such thing as free speech, which is why they know <coughs> platform, right? It's not, well, it is, it, it, so the debate about free speech is way deeper than who should be allowed to talk. The debate about free speech is whether or not there is such a thing 
as free speech outside the power game that neo-colonial exactly. Europeans are playing. And so what I'm doing and what you're doing with me and I think what everybody in the IDW is doing to some degree is speaking to people as if they are autonomous individuals who are the bedrock of civilization and sovereignty and that is absolute anathema to the radical left. And so they, they, they see that as a fundamental challenge, which it is. So the individual is the fundamental challenge. I think that's perfect for you because it's like you as an individual, Ben Shapiro, you get more hate online than pretty much anyone. And it's not just that you get hate, it's the nature of the hate where that you're a white supremacist. You happen to be wearing a yarmulke, which is a little confusing. You know, that you're, that you're a Nazi or the rest of it. And it's like, I know you're okay with criticism, but it's not criticism that they're leveling. It's just endless hate. It's, it's endless over the top yeah. hate. And well, that, that's the weird part. You know, if, if you're a good person, you try to be a good person, every time you receive a piece of criticism, as a good person, your first response should be, did I do something wrong? Yeah. Was it me, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and as somebody who's trying to get better at being a human and also just at what I do, I spend an awful lot of time trying to look at those criticisms and say, okay, is that reasonable? And usually it's something from you know ten years ago. It's like, okay, yeah, I, I should have done that better. That was that was stupid. I shouldn't have said that, right? Yeah, but and, it, but and, it isn't but, always ten years ago for you because you even had that nice moment in this studio where you said that you have a sort of public and private position on addressing trans people by pronouns that they want. Right, 100%. Where, where you don't want to be bludgeoned into doing it, but privately, if you knew someone that was trans and respected them, of course you would use the pronoun that Right, in the, in the same way that I would do that with, with anybody about anything, generally. If I'm in a private conversation with somebody and I, don't, and I want the conversation to progress beyond something that's unrelated, then I'm not going to go out of my way to offend them because it's, it's pointless. But in a public conversation where the, ex, the express topic being discussed is human biology, then I'm not going to give in to the argument that I have now given up my argument by using the pronoun of your choice because that is undercutting my own argument. We're now in a public debate. That's a different forum. Um, but that idea is that you are unsympathetic. And I think this goes to the fundamental conceit of folks on the left, which is that they are more sympathetic human beings and people who oppose them politically are unsympathetic human beings. And this goes back to the individual versus communitarian distinction. For the left, if you're an individual, this means that you are inherently unsympathetic to others because your individuality stands against the collective. Yeah. If, you yeah, are, that's a good if you're point. if you're a member of the collective, then you can show that by yeah. your the amount of sympathy that you have for, have the for, have for other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think But that, also for the collective, which the, is also right. a very weird form of sympathy. Right. Because the collective doesn't suffer. Mm -hmm. Individuals suffer. Right. You know, and, and that's a and then the other thing that's interesting about that reflexive identification of sympathy with virtue is that it's actually extraordinarily immature, as far as I'm concerned, because most complex problems aren't, uh, aren't solvable by reflexive sympathy. And reflexive sympathy is more like, a, it's more like an instinct. It's more like anger. It's more like jealousy or rage or, or love, for that matter. It doesn't have that cognitive component that enables you to take apart complex systems and to analyze them and determine what the problem is and what a solution might look like and then to lay that out in a cold and calculated manner towards some positive end. It's this automatic assumption that because you're overwhelmed with pity, let's say, mm -hmm. that that somehow makes you morally virtuous. And it, not only does it not make you morally virtuous, it's often the case that that, and this is the big Freudian observation, that that all-encompassing pity actually has a devouring component, and that's that overprotectiveness that, well, that Jonathan Haidt and, and mm. Lukinov have been writing about, for example. Right. And it's very, it's, it's, that interferes with the development of people's autonomy. And so the reflexive idea that because you're a sympathetic person, you're good, right. is, is bad enough, in addition to the fact that, well, all the sympathy is on the radical left, which it certainly isn't. Well, I think that one of the things that, that Haidt talks about, and this is where I think the left has taken advantage in so many areas, um, and I say the left, and I don't mean people who are liberal, I always make this distinction, there are people who are on the left, Thanks, man. Who, are, who are liberal, Appreciate and, mm -hmm. right, I mean, this is, this is Dave's point all the time, mm -hmm. if you're for free speech but you disagree with me about tax rates, you're a liberal. If you're somebody who's on the left and you want to shut down debate because you fundamentally believe that free speech is a conceit of the power structure, right. uh, then, then you are on the left. Um, yeah. But w what Haidt says, and he's correct about this, is that in any conversation you have with anybody, there's sort of an entry gateway to the conversation, and that is showing that you have goodwill. So showing yes. sympathy is one form of doing that. So what the left likes to do is prevent the conversation from happening by preventing you from appearing as a sympathetic human being, mm -hmm. meaning that 
So, for, for example, when I talk about transgenderism, the first thing that gets thrown at me is, you don't care about transgender people. Why are we even having this conversation? You're trying to be mean. You're trying to create violence yeah. against transgender yeah. folks. And this is why this language is constantly used. Because if we accept that I have tremendous sympathy for people who are suffering from what is, by any measure, a disorder, and if I say that we have to look at sympathy for these people and try and find the best scientific solutions and try and figure out what's best for society generally, not just for the transgender folks, but for kids who are teaching mm -hmm. who can be easily confused about gender. Or if we're looking at what's the best solution for doctors. There was an article in the New York Times like last week with a person suggesting that doctors should be forced to perform transgender surgery simply based on wants, not even based on an assessment of need. The doctor mm. should not be able to assess whether somebody needs yeah. the transgender mm. surgery yeah. or whether well, it will be... Well, that's basically the situation in Ontario already in Canada. Yeah, I mean, it's on demand. It's, it's mm. just like any other optional surgery. Yeah. Now. I mean, th this sort of stuff has real societal consequences. Mm. And, to be, and so what the left will do is they don't want to talk about the societal consequences. Instead, what they do is they say, you're not welcome in the conversation because you're unsympathetic. And so this is usually what's thrown at me. And you know, fairly enough in the sense that my slogan is facts don't care about your feelings. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is not that you shouldn't care about other people. It's that in the end, the solutions that are going to lead to better lives are not going to be feelings-based. They're going to be facts-based. This does not mean I have to be an unsympathetic human being. So, for example, this is a story that I really haven't told publicly because I don't like to tell these stories publicly because... You know, Maimonides has a basic principle of charity, which is the best form of charity is anonymous charity, mm -hmm. because then you don't get credit for it. So right, right. I don't want to make it seem like this happened simply because I was trying to take credit for it. But several weeks ago, I was speaking at a university, which will remain unnamed for, anon for anonymity reasons. And, I was, and this topic came up. A transgender person got up at the microphone and asked a question. And the conversation kind of went sideways. The person suggested, they started talking about their personal story, and I started kind of picking holes in the personal story a little bit. And it's probably an exchange that I could have handled better. But in any case, the person got very upset uh, and started to cry and then left. And this is all on tape. And it was one of those situations where because I give speeches in, in Q&A forums and because there are a lot of videos of me destroying people, yeah. it's one of those situations where if the tape comes out, it gets 5 million views and Shapiro destroys transgender persons. Right, right. And I don't want that to be what happens at my lectures. If there's going to be a Shapiro destroys video, which we don't even cut, then I would like it to be like just a rational exchange where everybody yeah. leaves feeling good about the exchange and somebody lost and somebody won. Fine. This was something different. The person got visibly emotionally upset, very upset. Uh, and the people who are running the event happened to know who this person was. So I called the person up on the phone and I said, that really didn't go how I wanted it to go. You know, I have my public position, but that's, that doesn't mean I don't have sympathy for you. I went to the organizers of the event. I had them cut that part out of the tape because there's no reason this person should be exposed to ridicule. And then I had coffee with the person the next morning to ensure the person was doing okay emotionally. Okay, that's not coming from a place of I don't care about people. Mm -hmm. This is coming from a place of these are important, vital public conversations. And shutting down those conversations by saying that I don't care about a human being, mm -hmm. that I don't care about what happens to people, is the nastiest form of no platforming because it's not just saying you don't deserve a platform for your views because your views are so terrible and so awful. It's saying that your views are inherently evil. Yeah. They're inherently sociopathic. And, and you are too. And you are too. And that's, and that's something that I, I think is actually a form of assholery well, beyond I, comprehension. I also don't think that you can care for people. I think that you can care for individuals. And I mean, one of the things that's been characterizing the tour that we've been doing is that like when I'm lecturing, I don't lecture to the audience. I lecture to individuals, and I'm not lecturing to them either. That's, that's the wrong way, because I always include myself in the discussion. So if we're talking about ethical principles and how they might be, um, uh, what would you call it, put forward or, or founded more, more solidly, then I'm always including myself in the list of perpetrators who need some improvement, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just discussing with people one at a time, even though they happen to be very large audiences. And then when I see people afterwards, because I meet about 150 people after each talk, then I get not a huge <coughs> amount of time, but enough time to make personal contact with each person. And I'm very careful to do that extremely carefully because I'm very happy they're there. And they often tell me a story about, you know, how they were suffering in some way or things weren't set right in their life and that they've been trying to develop a vision to aim high at something that's worth aiming at, which is part of the advantage of hierarchies, right, which, the, which is something we should talk about because you can't aim at something without privileging it over something else. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have anything to aim at, then you don't have any purpose in your life, and that's a bloody catastrophe. So anyways, they come up with a vision and they're trying to be more responsible. And then... The, the, the individualism aspect of this is, you know, I've, I've outlined to people that they're to take responsibility for themselves, 
which is not the same thing as to be individually selfish, and to do that in a way that also makes them responsible for their family, and to do that in a way that also makes them responsible for the community. So the individualism isn't the selfish individualism that the mm -hmm. leftists are criticism, criticizing by any stretch of the imagination. It's the individual positioned in an iterated game, right, that includes them as individuals stretched across time. So there's already a collective in that in some sense, and then them in relationship to family and the community. But stemming from the individual outward, which I think is part and parcel of the Judeo-Christian Enlightenment philosophy. Anyways, these people come and tell me this story, and they say they were in a bad place and that things have improved a lot, and they're kind of sad about the bad place part and visu visibly upset often, and then they tell me how things are impro improved, and they're really happy about that, and it's very touching and emotional, and that's where the that's where caring takes place. That's right at the level of the individual. I went into a Whole Foods yesterday, and this happens quite often, and so I, I was there, and two of the guys from behind the meat counter came out separately, and they said that they had been watching my lectures, and one of them talked about the fact that, you know, he has a seven-year-old son, and that he wants to do right by him, that he's been looking really hard for ethical and moral guidance, and that he's been reading and listening to my book, and concentrating on the parts about telling the truth and not lying, and I'm having these conversations with people one at a time about them striving hard to develop an ethical, philosophically grounded ethical perspective, you know, and it, it's so interesting to see this happening and to see who's doing it. Well, this is, this is, this is I think, an important point, is that I get asked a lot because I do get so much criticism and flack. I get asked a lot, have I ever been confronted in public? Because I got in public, you know, with my family to Disneyland, went on Thanksgiving yeah. to Disneyland, uh, and I got you know, uh, see, accosted, not not accosted, but people came up to me because they like my stuff or they enjoy it and they want yeah. to take pictures. Probably happened 35 to 40 times over the course of the day. And they asked me, have I ever, has there ever been a situation where somebody came up to you and said something mean or nasty? Yeah. I can't think of one. Yeah. I can't think of one time this has ever happened. Now, online, that's all I get. Yeah. And so the, the point here mm -hmm. is that when it comes to individuals who are affected yeah. and who actually, and who actually feel good or bad about you, yeah. It's a collective mob mentality yeah. that allows people to protest you and then protest me. And then that is picked up, the mob mentality is picked up by individual journalists who, are, who see themselves as sort of champions mm -hmm. of the people mm -hmm. broadly, but not champions of individuals. Because no. you still can't find the individual who's been victimized by Jordan Peterson. You still can't find the individual who's been victimized by Dave Rubin or yeah. the individual who's been victimized by Ben Shapiro. You can't find those people. So yeah. instead what it becomes is, oh, it's a broader group that's victimized, but none of those people have ever come to me personally and said, you victimized me, you hurt me, because they can't name a situation in which this has happened. Well, Instead, I, always love, become... I always love when they say that we're radicalizing people. And it's mm -hmm. like, if I open up my inbox, I'm getting emails from all sorts of people, usually on the right, who say that they were a little more extreme on the right, yeah. and that because they see a decent liberal who will treat them with respect, they've modified some mm -hmm. of their opinions. But what mm -hmm. do you think about this just at a, at a psychological level, the disconnect between what seems to be happening in the real world on a day-to-day -day basis and the way a huge amount of people are behaving online. W what do you think is psychologically happening? Well, it's, that's a tough one. I mean, it, it could easily be, like if you think of, of venues like Twitter, let's take Twitter as an example. We don't understand, we don't really understand much about how people communicate, period, psychologically. What, one of the things that psychologists do know is that if there's any distancing between you and a person, so for example, if you're inside a car, you're much more likely to act in an impulsive and hostile manner. And that, because one of the things that seems to mitigate against that impulsive hostility is whatever mechanisms kick in when you're face to face with someone. Mm -hmm. So those might be mechanisms that are associated with innate sympathy, for example. And so that regulates your behavior. And because most of the time in our evolutionary history, you were interacting right directly one-on-one -on -one with someone, that seemed to work out quite I mean, well. Cavemen weren't doing it with their No, 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 like no, 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 they had to, they had to carve in <laughs> insults into, the, into walls, and that, that took a lot of time. And so, but on Twitter, like, it could easily be, I, I read this little article here a while back showing what words needed to be in content for those to be most likely mm -hmm. retweeted, and they were almost all high-level negative emotion words. And yeah. so, it, it could be, you have this huge pool of people, and then it might be that only the person who's in a bad mood and is irritated that day or is sort of chronically like that or dispositionally like that, let's say, and who is specifically angry about something that they saw right then is likely to tweet. And so that gives you this tremendously skewed view of, of, 
of the of the consensus because you assume like if you if there's 100 people that show up in a mob outside your door you assume that there's more than 100 people mad at you right, right? they're they're a representative of a much larger group on <coughs> On Twitter, you can't tell if the 30 people who say snarky things, especially anonymously mm -hmm. to you, you can't tell if they're representative at all. And they're likely not. And, you know, that, that very narrow bandwidth, that 140 or 280 characters, might also be something that really facilitates angry, impulsive responding. Mm -hmm. And so we don't understand well, any of this psychologically. I mean, I think there's something else happening, too, and that is that both Twitter and Facebook, all social media is basically something different in human history in the sense that it's just a crowd without a purpose. So it's a crowd looking for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Meaning that throughout human history, when you actually had to have face-to-face -face interactions with people, the only reason you would show up in a crowd is because the crowd had a purpose. So where were you typically mm -hmm. doing this? Is You were going to a church, right? Everybody was right. there to worship. Everybody was there with a common goal in mind, right? You were a member mm -hmm. of the army, and so there's a common goal in mind. Anytime you were getting together, it was because there was a party, so everybody was there for the party. Twitter is legitimately people waking up and just... I want to interact with other humans. There are no other humans around. And so I'm here, and you're here, and we're all here. And look, somebody just said something. Ah, there's a common purpose. Let's jump on that. And then there's this backslapping effect of the person said something. And I mean, we all use Twitter, so we all know that if you are the, the most dangerous thing about Twitter, the most, if I could do anything with Twitter, I would get rid of the mentions tab. Mm -hmm. The reason being because if you are a, a, a if you are just a human, bad behavior, it basically. encourages bad behavior, especially because it encourages you to be looking and seeing how people are responding to you. Because as human beings, we're constantly looking to see how people are responding mm -hmm. to us. And so this is Which just- Which is generally a good thing. Right, yeah. it's generally a good thing, except that it's it's an ego machine. Yeah, so, so it's, that's it's, the so downside. Because the key, one of the keys to being a good person is to recognize most people aren't thinking about you 95% of the time, mm -hmm. right? You're not that important as a human. And so if, in order for you to be important, you actually have to do something important. But because Twitter functions in such a way that all you get is that feedback loop, it encourages you more and more to look for more of that feedback. It makes you feel good. I mean, you get a little endorphin rush every time there's a nice comment about you. You're fresh. You're fresh for more nice comments. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in real life. There's never a situation in real life in which that happens. And when it does, it's a major life event. It's a wedding. Mm -hmm. It's right. bar mitzvah. Right? It's something where people are collectively celebrating you. But mm -hmm. on Twitter, everybody is collectively celebrating everybody else and the people who issue the strongest opinions are the people who receive both the most condemnation and the most celebration. Mm -hmm. So in a weird mm -hmm. way, not that we want people to go into their bubbles, but are these town squares almost, they're almost too big to actually ever function properly. So every week there's another story where Jack says, I'm gonna get rid of the likes or I'm gonna get rid of follower accounts. And they're always trying to float these ideas to manipulate how we all behave with each other. But in an odd way, having everyone from everywhere on these platforms really doesn't make sense in some bizarre way. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. we should be in separate platforms. Well, there's no but, community, yeah, because, which is right. Ben's point. Right, so it's like we need something that has community, I think, but then the danger I mean, is that we end up in our little echo chamber. Right, I mean, the, the, the need, it's fascinating because if you look in other places on the internet, just structurally, the way that the community works is a little bit different. Uh, the way that it works, or it used to work 10 years ago, uh, when people actually visited websites directly, right. uh, was that you'd have something like a National Review the Corner, and it was a bunch of people, you know, like us, sitting around and discussing ideas back and forth and back and forth, like a group blog. Yeah. And it was restricted to the people who were uh, discussing the ideas. And then below or that... Or a video game board or anything exactly. else. Exactly. Yeah. And then below that, you'd have the comment section, which was all about those particular conversations. Because Twitter is fragmented, there's no actual conversation taking place on Twitter. There's me saying something and you responding to it and me not responding to you mostly, and then me tweeting another thought, and yeah. then you responding to it. And the idea of having a long-form conversation, every time it happens on Twitter, at the end of the conversation, you find someone saying, this isn't the appropriate place to have a, a long-form conversation. If we were going to do that, we'd be on a podcast. Yeah. We'd, be on, <laughs> right. We, right, we'd be writing each other letters. Like yeah. this, isn't, this isn't the way to do that. And even when I'm discussing with my peers, even when I'm talking with people on the left who I talk with on the phone, Instead of having a conversation on Twitter about the topic, I will call, pick up the phone and call them and have the conversation because you can't have a good conversation on mm -hmm, Twitter. You mm -hmm, just can't. Mm -hmm. How much of this is connected to one of the things that you've brought up in many of the lectures, which is that we're just getting information so much faster right now. We can not only just open up our phone and have basically the world right there, but we can listen to podcasts in double speed, which if you listen mm -hmm. to Shapiro in double speed, it's... You go back in time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I listen to you in half speed and it's still a little fast. I just but, sound drunk, yeah. Um, but that, the, the, just the, the nature of the technology, how it's just speeding up our ability to take in information, uh, maybe we haven't evolved fast enough. Well, it's also along we're taking that. in kind of pseudo information because it, it, it looks like information, but it's really low resolution. And so you get a lot of it, but it's not, 
It's not real knowledge. It's like oh, there was a funny New Yorker cartoon where a wife asked her husband, do you know that or do you just Google know it? <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> Which exactly. Is, right, right. And so, yeah. and the, but the, 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 the thing about those, those, those shallow media um, interactions is that you also don't have to take any responsibility for them, you know, especially if you're anonymous. And that also brings out the worst in people, you know, and, and, and the, the trolling phenomena. I mean, one of the things you notice about children, for example, is if children don't get enough good attention, they'll certainly go after bad attention mm -hmm. because the fundamental human currency is attention. And it's, it's one thing to be hated, but it's another thing entirely to be ignored. And I would say, generally speaking, if you put people in a corner and you made them choose, you know, if they were, if they had knowledge that was transparent to themselves, you said, well, would you rather be ignored or hated? They'd take hated because at least then you exist because mm -hmm. you exist at least in some part in your relationship to other people. And so some of the bad behavior is, is rewarded precisely for that reason is that it does draw attention and that does make you signify. I mean, yeah. you think about the people who do heinous crimes like the, the school shooters, people like that who do these things that are almost inconceivable. A huge part of the drive for that is fantasies about notoriety and, mm -hmm. and, 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 yep. and the emergence from obscurity and anonymity. Even though it's, it's notorious, it's hatred, the idea is, I'd rather be dead and infamous than alive and anonymous. Yeah, which, by the way, you, I think, were one of the first websites to say, we're not going to publish these people's yeah, names there, because then been, we're giving them exactly yeah, what they yeah, want. Yeah, exactly. Like, there, there, there have been, I don't want to take credit as, like, the first, because there are several, I'm trying, their names escape me, but there, there are other people mm. who have been promoting this for a while. But, mm. yeah, I was late to it. We should have done it earlier. Mm. And I I'm, talked and to I'm, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation about that about 10 years ago, about the idea that, publicizing the names of these killers is precisely one of the mechanisms that ensures that it will continue to happen and there's no doubt about that now how to how to mitigate against that is very complicated well, I mean and, and that, that does tie to a, a deeper conversation that, that did you see this this study that was from the CDC that came out that again for the second straight year life expectancy in the United States dropped mm -hmm. so we had consistent life expectancy increases in the United States for 150 years and now for the first time in American modern American history life expectancy has now dropped for two years in a row mm. and that's specifically due to two phenomena one is the increase in heroin overdoses and the other is suicide both uh, suicide is now at record rates in the modern era and we had 70,000 heroin overdoses opiate op overdoses last year uh, I think it was 50,000 the year before and so you're starting to see life expectancy decline there's a crisis of meaning and mm -hmm. that's why and I think that part of the resistance to particularly I think Jordan but I think also to me and to anyone else in the IDW who's at least searching for meaning is that the left has been saying for a long time that we found the meaning, right? The meaning was do what you want to do. The meaning was no responsibility, do what you want to do. That's the meaning. The meaning is rebelling against the system. And when it turns out that a lot of people don't find meaning in that, that there is in my perspective, a God-shaped hole in people's heart that is being filled by hatred and polarization and tribalism. Or that you just can't do it forever. No one can maintain that, that level forever of trying to tear everything down all well, the time. Well, it's, it's also, right? it, it, there's also, there's, 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 there's nothing in it, especially as your opponent weakens. You mm -hmm. know, this is, we, we thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about hierarchy. So, you know, the thing about, one of the things a hierarchy does is, is fundamentally is put some things above other things. And you think, well, the left criticize, the left criticism of that, which is a valid criticism, is that if you erect a hierarchy, well, let, let, me, let me step one step back. We'll, we'll walk through this in, in a bit of a sequence. Okay, so the first proposition would be, we do have real problems, Pe because people suffer, and like, we have real problems, and we would also like to solve them, and that solutions do exist, and that if you have a solution, and then you implement it socially, and so you have to get people to cooperate and compete around the solution. You're going to produce a hierarchy. And if the hierarchy is valid, then the people who are the best at producing the solution to the problem are going to lead the hierarchy. Okay, so that would be a conservative right-wing position. It's like, we need hierarchies. They, they privilege values, and they're necessary to solve problems. And there is a relationship between the ability to solve the problem and the structure of the hierarchy. Okay, so when we say that's true when hierarchies are functioning well. Okay, so that's the right-wing viewpoint. And then the left-wingers would say, wait a second, your hierarchy gets rigid over time and ossifies and can be occupied by people who use power instead of competence to dominate it, and they do that unfairly, and they warp the structure of the hierarchy, and that makes it 
difficult for people to gain entry, including talented people. And then the hierarchy itself as a structure has a problem because dispossessed people tend to stack up at the bottom. And that all seems relevant and true, right? So, so then, then you could say, well, you need the right because you need the hierarchies and, and, and they need to be implemented. And that's what managers and administrators do. That's what conscientious people do because they're hierarchically oriented. And it's a very efficient way of operating. And people are actually happier within hierarchies because there's an identifiable chain of command. But then the left has its position, which is, yeah, but you got to watch out for the dispossessed because they're the majority. And you have to make sure the thing doesn't degenerate towards tyranny. So then I think the political discussion is the left and the right constantly eyeing each other to make sure that the hierarchical structures maintain their good health. And so, and that's why freedom of speech is necessary. Okay, so the, now, the, the issue with that, let's see if I can get back to where I was, I was going with this to begin with. Oh yes, the issue with that is that if you're just a rebel, you say, well, we're going to criticize the system, whatever that is, so that's a very vague thing to begin with, you demolish that value hierarchy. And, and the idea of value hierarchies as such, but then that puts you in a terrible conundrum. And, and this is what I've been focusing on in my public lectures, is that if you accept the essential idea that life is suffering, and life is suffering tainted by malevolence, which I think is an even more accurate formulation, you have a fundamental existential problem, and that's the suffering. And then you need a meaning to set against that, to, 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 to fortify you against the catastrophe. So, and if you demolish the hierarchies, then you have no meaning. There's nothing to strive for. And without that meaning, you're anxious and overwhelmed by definition. We know that neuropsychologically because purpose boxes you in, right? It gives you a game to play and rules to follow. <clears throat> and then purpose gives you something to aim at in positive emotion. And so the problem with what the left is offering, and I think this is actually the kind of problem that Sam Harris and the atheist types are running into too, is that it's like, well, okay, where's the purpose? Well, we don't have one. It's just rebellion against the unfair hierarchy. It's like, yeah, but the hierarchy also provides you with value. Well, that's okay. It's cost is so high, we're going to demolish the hierarchy. Well, then you're left with nothing. Well, but no, you're not left with nothing because you're left, what you're left with is an inalienable suffering, so, not nothing. That's the suicide. And, and, I, and I think that the, the left solution to that has been intersectionality, meaning what they've done is they've yes. just taken the, hier they've taken the hierarchy and they've said, the hierarchy is bad because it's ossified and it's terrible. And it's not just that they've destroyed the hierarchy and then we are all leveled. It's that they've inverted the hierarchy in certain ways. That merit itself has become a sign that you are an exploiter. Yes. Right? That if you are that if you're on the top of the hierarchy, then it's because you did something wrong to get there and you hurt yes. someone to get there. Yes. And therefore, the, the last shall be first. We're going to just take this triangle and we're going to flip it upside yep. down. So that way, the okay, people so, who are at the bottom are at the top. So I think, that, I think there's something absolutely fundamental there, too, because I've been trying to understand what the core issue is that drives the pathological left. And I think it is the story of Cain and Abel, fundamentally, is that it's, it's jealousy of the successful. And... And the worst kind of successful person, as it turns out, it, from a jealousy perspective, think, speaking psychologically, is like, if you got your power arbitrarily, if you inherited it, or you got it unfairly, well, you're kind of annoying, but you're not that annoying because you're not that good. You're just <laughs> right. lucky. Right. And so right. I can be jealous of you because this you're lucky, right. and that's unfair, but you're just as reprehensible as me. Right. But then let's take the alternative position. Let's say that I'm not taking responsibility for my life in any sense, and I'm not bearing any moral load. And it turns out that not only are you successful, but you're competent and good. Well, then you're a real enemy because you're a judge under mm -hmm. those circumstances, right? Because it's, it's your goodness in some sense, your competence and your goodness that's really showing me in a negative light. And instead of wanting to contend with that and to, to see myself reflected badly in your mirror, then I'm going to make the accusation that everything you've done is merely a consequence of power. And, and even deep, more deeply, I'm going to criticize the idea of merit and competence itself yep. because that gets me out of my self-loathing. Say, well, there's none of that's real. None of that merit, none of that competence is real. And none of the failure that I'm experiencing is a consequence of my own inaction. Yep. It's all someone... And then it's all someone else's fault, and then I get to be justified in going after them as well. Yeah. So that's that's the it's, icing it's, on the cake. And the Cain and Abel story is, I mean, it's explicit about this. Yeah. I mean, this isn't even buried in the text, right? That's explicit. I mean, God specifically says to Cain, 
Tim Shell, right? You have the capacity to overcome, yes. right? And Ken ignores right. it, and then he goes and kills Abel. Yeah, and that, that's the whole idea. The, the, Yo, that's he, the crux of that story. Is that because Cain complains to God? Right. Says what? He basically says something along the lines of, "Life's not fair. How, what well, happened? How, <laughs> that's right. How dare you set up a universe like this, where I'm breaking myself in half, attempting to, you know." to thrive and everything's going against me and I have my brother who, mm -hmm. who everything that he touches turns to gold. And that's right, God says to him directly, look to yourself. It's, it's your inadequacy that's driving this. And it's the last thing that Cain wants to hear. And, that it's, uh, it is, and that's it, what makes him murderous. And, and I think that that is the last thing that most people want to hear. That's what's so attractive about a leftist ideology that doesn't actually provide any sense of meaning outside of the victimhood cult. Mm -hmm. So this feeling that the, the last thing that people want to hear generally is look to your look to yourself mm -hmm. first. It's it's a lot but, easier to I mean, but, okay, but it's, it's also so bad funny. parenting, right? But, I mean, well, like, but it's also funny <laughs> because one of the things that's happening in my lectures is because I've been doing something different. You know, instead of saying, see, I think one of the things that the conservative types do wrong with regards to responsibility is that they 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 conceptualize it too rigidly in ter terms of duty mm -hmm. and should. And that, that's, a, that's true, but it's also a mistake because what I've been suggesting to people is that, no, you don't understand, is that all the meaning in your life is going to come as a consequence of accepting responsibility. Yep. It's not merely a matter of duty. It's that you mm. need this sustaining meaning because otherwise you, you suffer stupidly and you get bitter and you get resentful and you get cruel and you get homicidal and you get genocidal. That's the whole pathway. And so that's, that's a catastrophe. That's hell. And so if you don't have something meaningful to pursue, to, to set against that, that's, that's, your, that's the degeneration of nihilism. Okay, so where do you find the response? Where do you find the meaning? Say, well, you look at people that you admire, and almost all the people you admire are people who take on a heavy burden of responsibility. And if the responsibility is associated with the value hierarchy, so you're trying to pursue something of ultimate value, so that's the responsibility, that gives you meaning. And so you can talk to people about taking responsibility for their um, inadequacy if you point out to them that who they could be is much better than who they are so that there's a trajectory and so that the idea of taking on responsibility even for their own inadequacies and errors is all of a sudden associated with hope and not with only condemnation. And that works. And that, like, when, when I lay out that line of argument in the lectures, and Dave's seen this multiple times, it's always the case that the lecture halls go silent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, people it, are absolutely riveted on that idea. And this is, it was interesting. I did an interview with Tucker Carlson, who I know is in here with you also. And one of the things that we talked about was, you know, what people should do in dying towns. They're in areas where the industry has left. What should they do? They're experiencing difficulty. And I was saying that telling people that the jobs are coming back falsely is not going to actually do anything for them. That the, the only thing that you're guaranteed in America or in a free country is the adventure, right? That's what you're guaranteed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's also what makes life meaningful mm -hmm. is that sense of adventure. That's what yeah. America was built on, right? That's the fundamental command, the very first command that Abraham has ever given is get up, leave the land of your fathers where you're Have comfortable an and go someplace yep. where you, I'm not even gonna tell you where you're going. You're just gonna yeah. go there. And then when you get there, maybe you'll know, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's the, but I, I think that one of the areas, Jordan, where you and I, uh, I think it would be interesting to drill down is when it comes to directing toward the purpose, how do we define what the purpose is? Because I think one of the things that's been difficult in the West, at least since the death of the Judeo-Christian value system in many ways, or at least the, the uh, sort of, we're running on the fumes of the Judeo-Christian value system is yeah. the truth. But since the, since the decline of the importance in many people's minds of that value system, the decline of biblical living, has been this idea, you can create your own meaning. Yeah, right. right? You just, that if, if you find something that you truly care about, and then you mm -hmm. pursue that thing that you truly care about, this will bring you happiness. And that may be true for a certain number of people, but the vast majority of people are incredibly crappy at coming up with their own meanings. Yeah. There has to be something that is out there that is discoverable in order for it to be oh, I discovered. I think that's what the psychoanalysts, that's why I liked Jung so much, because that what, that's what made him such an astute critic of Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche believed we had to create our own values. But the psychoanalysts, starting with Freud, started to note that the values were actually built in. And Freud saw that, first of all, in dreams. Right, and then Jung, Jung took that apart and associated the dreams with the myths and said, no, no, you, do, you don't understand, is that the values are built in. You don't create them, you can rediscover them. And that's the resurrection of the father from, 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 the, from I mean, the belly and, and of the, the beast. This does raise a question as to, and we, you and I have discussed this before, yeah. is, is where exactly that moral system comes from. So Kant obviously talks about the idea that uh, you know, he, he believes in God because of the starry sky above and the moral law within. Yeah, you, can, right. you can discover all this within. I am not convinced that human beings can actually discover meaning within, because if that were true, 
than the prosperity and liberalism and human rights and value for individuals and all the things that we associate with the good stuff in the West, that would have been universal. And it is not, in fact, universal. It mm -hmm. arose at a certain time in a particular place associated with a particular value system. This is why when people ask me about why I think that revelation is necessary, why it's important, it's because I think that without you're going to have to make these fundamental assumptions to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to make fundamental assumptions at point A. Now, you can either get that from revelation, or you can just assume it, and then try to explain where those assumptions came from, or you can just pretend those assumptions don't exist, which is, I think, actually what, what Sam sort of does. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I hate to criticize Sam in his absence, but I think that Sam sort of just assumes that when he says things like, we're here for the greater flourishing of human beings. Yeah. You actually have to define every one of those terms. There are a bunch of assumptions baked into yeah. what yeah. all of that means that he's making, and I'm not sure that Sam will acknowledge he's making them. Um, but the, that's why, to me, and this is sort of thesis of, of my book next year, the, the West is built on the, the basic revelations of Jerusalem, meaning you, human beings are made in God's image mm -hmm. with individual value mm -hmm. and with individual purpose and with a collective purpose where we get together and we pursue living in a more virtuous way. Mm -hmm. And that's one pole. And the other pole is the reason of Greece, where we have the capacity to look at the world around us and draw conclusions from that world. And on those poles are built all of modern science, are built all of economics, mm -hmm. are built the free speech and free, and free lives that, that we live right now. And I think that we have been gradually over the last 200 years chipping away mm -hmm. at both of those poles, Jerusalem in terms of revelation and Athens in terms of reason, which we've yeah, abandoned yeah. for postmodernism, yeah. and that's so, just yeah, deprived yeah. us of purpose. Yeah, so in yeah, a weird yeah, way, yeah. is this the failure of the Enlightenment liberals? All the people that I grew up loving and caring about, and the people that I still admire, that, and this, this little sliver of liberals that still remain, that haven't bought into leftist dogma, but that aren't necessarily religious per se, mm -hmm. or believe in these stories, but really, they, they believe it comes from the Enlightenment period. I think so it, is, I think that's a good so that, observation. So that, so that this is sort of their failure. I don't make, I don't want to. I'm not blaming. It's their them. arrogance, I would say, because even people because like, there's not enough to there's not enough in the secular world you, to I, fight to fight this new religion. No, that's it's, what, it's like that's where I'm sort of finding myself right now, which is an incredibly uncomfortable place. I come from a much more atheist perspective, yeah, right. obviously, yeah. than you, and, and certainly yeah. where you are. Yeah. And yet, I I can see what the future is now. And it's like, there's nothing left over there. And we do need some oh, fundamental you, well, truths. You can't, That's just the position that I've been cornered into. You can't have the Enlightenment into. without the mythos underneath it. Exactly. You see, so this exactly is where you right. and Sam well, disagree, Well, and also right? with, with, where I disagree with people like Stephen Pinker. Exactly. I mean, I'm an this Enlightenment right. guy. But the thing is, is that when, when I look backwards in time, you know, what, what, what people like Harris and Pinker attribute to the Enlightenment, <laughs> I see as the Enlightenment being the latest flowering of a process that was indescribably older than that. This and, is and, exactly and, right. And in, the, and, in the, and in the historical sense, certainly grounded in the religious traditions, but in, and then from my perspective, grounded in something that's biological, that's far deeper than that, like, like our true proclivity towards admiration for competence and reciprocity. And I do think that has to be socialized, back to your point. So I wanted, to, one of the things Dave they, mentioned yeah. before we, we started this mm -hmm. was that we could have a bit of a conversation about the difference between Judaism and Christianity in I, terms I'd, of... I'd love to get to that. I do yeah. want to make one comment yeah. on the, yeah. the neo-enlightenment stuff. So, I mean, I, I will say that there is a full chapter in my book that is specifically about the views of a lot of people who I love, you know, Sam and Michael Shermer and, yeah. the, and, and Pinker and the whole neo-enlightenment strain of thought that I think kind of includes Jonah Goldberg on the conservative side. Yeah. And uh, I and love these guys, and I feel, intellectually, I feel more comfortable with that position, but well, I realize I'm just being whittled away. I, well, I, I just I, see I it can't that, hold so, much So longer. here's my basic view and my basic thesis, is that there are two views of the Enlightenment. One is that, in Jonah Goldberg's words, it was the miracle, that it, it kind of sprang from nowhere, suddenly reason dominated over revelation, and it crushed revelation, and in the wake of that crushing came the full flowering of economics and humanity and freedom and liberalism, mm -hmm. And yeah, and that those things were opposed, reason and revelation the, were opposed exactly. for these that. Exactly, that these were, yeah. and, and not only that, they, they weren't intention, they were fulsomely opposed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's truth that reason and revelation are intention, but it is also true that certain assumptions undergird the assumptions of reason. Yes. In order for you to believe that reason exists and isn't just a, an evolutionarily favorable firing of neurons, mm -hmm. then you have to, if you, have, if you like, I, I think that Sam's position that objective truth exists in the absence of anything remotely approaching a, a, uh, a system of, of assumptions is unsupportable. It's completely unsupportable. I think that, I think that because you are built to 
create more little copies of you. Right? I mean, this is evolutionarily speaking what you are created to do. How that has to do with discovering objective truth is utterly beyond me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, and, and what it has to do with the existence of objective truth. In any, in any case, the Enlightenment is based on certain fundamental assumptions. It's based on the idea that you can act as an individual freely by making rational decisions in a predictable world of mm -hmm. laws. Right? All, All of every that. one of those assumptions is ungrounded in, in a world of pure scientific determinism. It just doesn't, it doesn't exist. So the, so the Enlightenment the, wait, actually ate itself. Right. The Enlightenment ate itself. What happened mm -hmm. is that so that's there was this, what is that now, the, yeah. enlighten, the Enlightenment was, and I think that you see this in Kant, who's de Kant sees all of this. He sees that this struggle is coming, and so he attempts to re-inject religion and spirituality and God back into a moral system without actually saying so. Mm -hmm. right? Kant is not actually an atheist. Kant is actually trying to create a rational basis for Christian revelation and Christian reasoning so that he can avoid the trap of having to cite the Bible, but he can say that all of this makes sense anyway. Well, that's why I see this as the failure of the modern liberals, because it's like, even with some of, some of our IDW crew, that most of these people, most of us, come from the left originally. And it's like, well, the position we're at now is, there's no one on the left that will talk to any of us without attacking us or doing any of the usual tricks. Now we've got all of these people like you and Prager and the rest of them that are willing to talk to us, willing to debate, all, you know, all of this. And I still see a hesitancy because people, it's so, it's so sort of built into people that conservatives are evil or that mm -hmm. even thinking about the world through a religious lens or anything like that is somehow evil or dumb or, or something like that. And it's like, I, I just can't play by well, that well, game Well, I, I think that the, the psychoanalysts and, and some of the neuroscientists that I knew too, the ones that were more informed about, about emotion and motivation, and also interested in dreams and instincts. So those would be the neuroscientists who are more concerned with emotion, eh, rather than the cognitive types. The cognitive types are like the rationalists in the psychology mm -hmm. field. They're very um, open to the, to, they were surprisingly open to Jungian ideas. You know, the idea that, you know, our, our rationality is embedded inside our emotions, and that's all embedded inside our motivations, and that's all embedded inside our bodies. Like, so rationality isn't this, this, what would you call it, free-floating uh, uh, soul in some sense that's capable of contemplating the objective world, but something that's deeply embedded inside all sorts of uh, other structures on which its validity is dependent. One of the things the psychoanalysts were so good at pointing out, and that I think is in accordance with the neuropsychological evidence, is that your rationality is bounded by the dream. And it's literally that way because if you are deprived of dreaming, which kind of puts you in the mythic world, <coughs> then you go, you literally lose your mind. There has to be that continual dialogue between revelation that would be associated with the dream world and rationality, or rationality cannot sustain itself. And the reason for that is that, as far as I can tell, is that the assumptions of rationality are in the, myth, in the mythos, which was the argument that I was trying to make continually with Sam. And so then the question is, what constitutes the mythos? And so you, one of your points was, well, there's this idea that human beings are made in the image of God. And so I've been thinking about that a lot. And so my sense is something like this, is that, and you tell me what you think mm -hmm. about this. Okay, so you wake up in the morning and your consciousness emerges from nothing in some sense. And what you see in front of you, you aren't determined like a clock in what you're going to do that day. In fact, your consciousness is in fact that part of you that deals with what is not yet determined. Because all the things that you do that are fundamentally habitual and deterministic right. are unconscious. Right. They turn into habit and you don't have conscious control over them. So consciousness seems to be that element that deals with what has not yet been determined. Okay, so you wake up in the morning and what you confront as far as I'm concerned is potential. There's a, there's a field of potential in front of you and that, that's the future, what, whatever that is, that potential. It's, it's what could be and what is not yet. And then as a consequence of the choices that you make, guided by your ethical aims, then you transform that potential into actuality. And you literally do that with your consciousness. And I think that's the reflection of the image of God in man. And I think that's what's put forward in the earliest sections of Genesis, because that's what God does, right? God is a structure. He confronts nothingness with with something approximating right. consciousness, the logos, and he extracts out order from potential. And, and then... One of the things that's interesting about that, there's the repetition of the idea in, in Genesis that if you confront potential with truth, so that's the logos, let's say, with truth, then the order that you produce is good. 
So there's a so which is a really interesting ethical claim, right? Mm -hmm. You take this potential, you interact with it morally. The consequence of interacting it morally is that you produce reality, and the reality that you produce is good. And then human beings are a microcosm of that. That does that seem yeah, right? no, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I think that th this is the kind of philosophy in philosophy terms. This is basically the argument of both Maimonides and, and Thomas Aquinas, who are making this argument basically at the same time, is that, you know, at the beginning when it says, Bereshi, Barawa, Kimet, Shemayim, Ba'adhar, it's that, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What makes human beings in the image of God is our creative capacity. And the creative capacity is the ability to transform through an act of will something that was not into something that, that is. is. Uh, and that's what the beginning chapters of Genesis are. It's God taking things yeah, and just okay. making them. And then what makes them good is that these things are, this is the Aristotelian part, mm -hmm. is, the, is that these things are directed toward a purpose. Toward a purpose. So what the, the idea of Greek rationality, what distinguishes it from other ideas of rationality, is that Greek rationality is based on a fundamental premise, which is that you can look at a thing and the thing was made for something, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at a, if you look at a glass, the glass was made to hold liquid, mm -hmm. and you can tell that because that's the nature of the glass. Now, there's nothing in science that says a glass was made to hold liquid. It's just a piece of, of glass that is made in a certain particular shape. But we, as human beings, know that this glass was made to hold liquid, and that we can look at the universe in the same way. That we can we can say what was the purpose of this thing, and that's why when God says that something is good, the the use of the word good in in Aristotelian thought is good is fit for the purpose. What makes you a, a good pilot, for example, is your capacity to land a plane. Mm -hmm. What makes this a good glass is its capacity to hold liquid. And what makes you a good person is your capacity to use rationality in pursuit of virtue mm -hmm. and to transform the world around you in doing so. That's mm -hmm. what makes you a good mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And so when it says at the beginning of Genesis that God has the tree of good and evil and that you are the knowledge of good and evil and it's a sin to eat from the knowledge of good and evil, my understanding of that is that what human beings did is instead of trying to function according to figuring out what God's purpose for things was, trying to figure out what the universe was to be used for in accordance with reality, we decided to superimpose our own vision of what reality should be in a moral sense, and that there's a fundamental disconnect there and it leads to suffering. All right, so let's, let's dumb this down for just one second, I, I, because I wanna ask a question that I know you don't like getting when we get in the Q and A's, but I think it would be interesting for the three of us to sort of kick it around here, which is for the average person that, that's listening to this that can only take in so many of these ideas and so, <laughs> so much of this, right? And I think that actually is most people that are just living their lives. I think a certain set of people are listening to both of you and going, all right, these two guys think that some guy is talking to them from the sky. I mean, I know this is, this is the most, I know why this, you don't love this question because it's so ridiculously oversimplified. But how, how do you get to those people then? For the people that think, well, wait a minute, what are, you, what are you talking about? Shapiro loves facts over feelings, but he's talking about this imaginary sky guy that wrote this book and blah, blah, blah. What do you think is the, is there a psychological trick to sort of get people over that hump if you wanted them to start exploring some of this? Because well, you know what I mean, we can, we can do the high level stuff for hours right. and hours, but, but eventually it just keeps getting to a sort of smaller and smaller place that people can, can get to. All right, so that, that's, so, that's so hard a question, and so I'll, I'll try to address it this way. So there's a line in the New Testament where Christ says that no one comes to the Father except through him, which is a hell of a thing for anyone to say. I mean, there's a lot of statements in the New Testament that are strikingly strange in that manner. I am the way and the truth and the life. That's another one. It's associated with the same idea. Yeah. And we'll and so, get to some of the yeah, New okay, Testament. Okay, so, Testament well, so here's, here's the idea, and, and it, it bears on your question, although I don't exactly know how. It's as if there's a spirit at the bottom of things that is, that is involved in the, in, the, in the bringing to being of everything. So, like, so for example, people talk about evolution as a random process, but that's not true. It's not true. The mutations are random, but there's also a lot of sources, other sources of genetic <coughs> variant, variation. But the selection mechanisms are not random. So, now then the question is, what are the selection mechanisms? So, I'm going to have to go a bunch of places yeah. to answer this <laughs> question. Survival mostly, well, but, I think. Well, here's yeah. one selection mechanism. Yeah. It's like, so, s human females are very sexually selective. That's why you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. So, the male failure rate for reproduction is twice that of the females. Huh. Okay, so, the question is, well, how is it that males succeed differentially? And the first answer is, well, females reject. If human females reject. But then the question might be, well, they reject on the basis of what? 
And the answer is, well, it's something like competence. And then the question is, well, how is competence defined? And then the answer to that is, well, men put themselves in hierarchies and they vote on each other's competence. And it's really counterintuitive in some sense from an evolutionary perspective because you'd have to ask yourself, why would men put themselves in positions where they elevate some men in status mm -hmm. and then give them a huge reproductive advantage given that that's to their reproductive disadvantage in, in some sense? Okay, and there are reasons. For, part of that might be, well, let's say you decide to follow the best leader in a battle. Well, then you don't die. Like, he might get all the women, but you don't die, so at least you're still in the game. Yeah. And it might be the same if you're following the greatest hunter. And the greatest hunter wouldn't be the person who was best at bringing down the game. It would be the person who was best at bringing down the game and sharing it and organizing the next hunt and all of that, mm -hmm. right? And so men will organize themselves into groups and privilege certain men, and that puts them ahead in the reproductive hierarchy. And so what that means to some degree is that there's a, a spirit of masculinity that's shaping the entire structure of human evolutionary history. That's what that means. Mm. And then I think, okay, well, that might just be a biological epiphenomenon. And so it would be a spirit that, it's the spirit of positive masculinity that manifests itself across epochal ages, millions of years perhaps, and it actually has shaped our consciousness, actually. And so you can think about that as a figure, and it would be the figure that emerges. It's like, it's like the... It's like, this, it's like the essential spirit of all the great men who defined what greatness constituted. That's a spirit. Okay, now that's a purely biological explanation. Mm -hmm. You could say, well, that's God for all intents and purposes. You might have an image of that built right into you. Even the sense that you can experience something divine and paternal might be merely a reflection of that evolutionary process. So that would be a biologically reductive argument mm -hmm. for the existence of what we experience as God. But then there's another possibility too, which is that that's actually reflective of a deeper metaphysical reality that has to do with the nature of consciousness itself. And I would say that I think that's true, is I believe the biological case, and I believe the biologically reductive case, but I don't think that exhausts it. I think that there's a metaphysical layer underneath that that the, bio that the biology is a genuine reflection of. And that's the sort of the macrocosm above and the microcosm below. That, yeah. we, that we are really reflective, including in our consciousness, of something about the structure of reality itself. And that might involve whatever whatever it is that God is. Well, see, so that, that's why I think this is so interesting, because what you're doing there, especially at the end, is you're, you're giving it a little room to say, I don't know, right? Well, you I have mean, to. Yeah, but I think that that's what people don't want to grant you well, this is, but and this I, is and why I'm curious I don't if like you give that room as well. Do you well. believe in God? Right. It's like, well, that's like, it's, to me, that question is always like, well, what makes you so sure that you know that God exists? Right. It's like, well, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not willing to claim that certainty, you know, but, well, but... I laid out the argument. I don't, right. I don't know what you yeah, think. So what, what do you think about when he takes it all the way to that end and then there's that little space at the end? I mean, again, I don't think that that's severely problematic in terms of just general religious thought. I mean, mm. the, the general religious thought going back thousands of years, and this is why when you look at Aquinas' proofs of God, what he comes to is he, he says basically what you say, which is if you go down deep enough, then you get to something. And that something is what we call God. So he doesn't say God, he doesn't, the Bible starts from the premise God exists and he created the universe. Mm. Aquinas starts from we have a universe, what says God is there? And he says, well, when you go all the way down deep enough, there has to be a force that lies behind the combined logic of the universe, and that thing is what we call God, right? And so he's trying to reason his way back to first principles. And I think that the, the case for God, not in the way that we think of him as like a jolly bearded guy in the sky who like takes care of all of our problems or anything, but the idea that there is a logos, right? This is, the, mm -hmm. There's a structure, a fundamental structure to the way life is, and there, there is a reason and a fundamental purpose to why mm -hmm. life is. And what mm -hmm. lies below that, you can call God. Mm -hmm. And that and without, consciousness and without, has some association with it. Well, and, and that, well, the, your consciousness reflects God. Again, this, mm -hmm. is the, this is one of the fundamental, this is sort of Leibniz's proof of God, is that the principle of sufficient reason, the idea that you are capable of understanding the universe. If you actually believe you're capable of understanding the universe <laughs> in any way, in mm -hmm. any way, then your mind has to in some, if you believe in objective reality as Sam does, mm -hmm. and you believe that your mind is capable of grasping an objective reality, not an evolutionarily beneficial reality, but an objective reality, your mind is reflecting a greater mind, right? Your mind is reflecting a greater logic. Well, what stands behind that greater logic? It must be something. Right? And so this is the idea that there is a God that stands behind that. So the proof for God, I think, honestly, is, is not supremely difficult. And I think that we all do have, whether it's biologically sourced or, in my view, logically sourced, uh, a belief 
that there is a structure to the universe, a predictable structure to the universe that didn't emerge out of simple randomness, and there's a reason that things are the way that they are, and that from that we can draw the fact that we are capable of acting within that logical universe. If everything were sheer chaos, you could not act. You'd be right. paralyzed by the chaos that surrounds you. So, so, um, so would you both argue then that at a micro level and at the individual level, you could live a perfectly good, decent life with whatever moral subset course. you create of yourself, course. but that but that I think ultimately you're both making the argument that at a macro level, a society just can't can't You can't flourish. function it's, without it's, the mythos. No, you're embedded in that. And so, well, and I was talking about this Christian idea too. So, so I've been thinking about that statement about um, no one comes to the Father except through me. And I thought, okay, well, what does that mean exactly? And I've, I've worked a lot, a lot of this out over these lectures that, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that you and I have been participating in. Well, so there is this notion and that, that Haidt and Lukianoff are also pursuing in, in the coddling of the American mind that, you know, one of the ways that you ennoble people and encourage them is by having them confront things that are um, frightening to them, that are beyond them. So what do you, what you really want to do is you want to optimally challenge people. And what that does is make them braver and stronger, not less afraid. Mm -hmm. It makes them more courageous and more competent. Okay, and I would say the clinical evidence for that is overwhelming. If you, if you poll a hundred educated clinicians and you, and you say to them, well, is there utility in having people get their ethical story straight and face the things that they're avoiding? They're all going to say, yes, those are fundamental, fundamentally curative. And this is quite literally what we're doing the reverse of at college. Yes, right? exactly. It's quite yeah. literally the reverse of that. Yeah. Okay, so now here, here's the idea. Here's the idea. So imagine that you are in some sense the embodiment of that paternal spirit that has characterized mankind since the dawn of time. It's locked in you. It's part of your potential. And maybe that's coded. That's coded at least in part biologically, but it's also co coded sociologically. It, it's, it's in the air, so to speak, around you, in, in the mythos and in the stories we tell each other. Okay, so now what you decide to do, and this is, this is where I think we could have an interesting conversation about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. So there's an idea in Christianity, which is, I think, the central idea, which is that you need to face the potential for malevolence that exists within you and in the world. So that's Christ's confrontation with the devil in the desert, with Satan in the desert. You have to come to terms with that malevolence. That's part of existence. And you have to voluntarily accept the burden of suffering. And so that's the acceptance of the cross. Okay, so you take on that. You say the suffering... So there's an idea that Christ is a messianic figure because he took the suffering of the world onto himself. And what that means to me is that he was someone speaking... Um, conceptually, who decided that the suffering of the world was his responsibility mm -hmm. and that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to decide that that's your responsibility. You take that on a bur as a burden. You do the same with the malevolence. So when you read history, you read history as a perpetrator, right? Maybe you also read it as a victim, but you certainly read it as a perpetrator. And then that's on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the question is, what happens when you do that? And I would say the answer is two things. Is that, first of all, it starts to force you to develop, like to learn what you need to learn in the world and to absorb the information that would enable you to start to face the suffering and to rectify it. So that forces you to become a more competent person. And that's the socialization part that you thought of as so important. But then there's a secondary thing that happens too, which is that taking on that additional stress and demand voluntarily transforms you biologically because within your genetic structure, let's say. There's all sorts of potential, but that won't be unlocked unless you place yourself in a position where the demands necessitate it. And so by following that pathway, truth, let's say, the acceptance of suffering and the confrontation with malevolence, so that's the heaviest load that you could take on, then you actually produce a psychophysiological slash spiritual transformation in yourself that matures you into like the representation of the Father on Earth. That's why that that's how that lays so, itself out. Okay, so I'm glad, I'm glad he got us here because the question that I said to you, I, there was only one thing I said to you guys before yeah, we yeah. started that I wanted to get to something about most of the lectures that you're, when we're doing these things, you're usually talking about the Old Testament. Now, obviously, you're an Old Testament guy. I'm on But my, my question was, do you think that Ben or, or just people that believe in the Old Testament exclusively are missing something. So you just laid out a case of something that potentially is missing so there. Do you think that argue. is a I'm fair argue. argument? Well, what I'm gonna argue is that what you just said is fundamentally unchristian in the sense that you're saying that everyone is supposed to imitate Jesus 
And the basic conceit of, from what I understand, uh, speaking with Christian theologians, is that we are fundamentally incapable of taking on our own sin. And so we have to have somebody who comes in the form of Christ on earth in order to accept that suffering for us. And that that is the purpose of God actually embodying himself in Christ, is to provide human beings the capacity to withdraw from original sin. That we don't actually have the capacity hmm. beyond a certain point to overcome. And that's why Jesus as a singular figure is necessary. I actually agree from a Judaic point of view with everything that you say, because for me it's about accepting the responsibility for my own sins on myself. And I don't have the ability to say that there is... The, the suffering servant, the suffering Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself to relieve me of my sins mm -hmm. and therefore give me a fair shot at life. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so okay, that's a, that's a really good objection, I think. And I think that there's a fair bit of confusion about that in the Christian community, for example. So I would say that that perspective is more explicitly Protestant. And then, then I would put the Catholics next to that, but then I would put the Orthodox types fairly far away from that, which is why so many Orthodox Christians, I think, have been interested in what I'm saying, because their sense, and this is where my knowledge of Christian theology starts to run out, because mm -hmm. like, I'm not an expert on, you know, in, the, in the doctrinal differences. Right. Um, their sense is that it's the imitation that's of primary importance. Now, mm -hmm. it's, it's a weird thing, because even in classical Christianity, you have, let, let's say, Protestant Christianity, you have this idea that, well, Christ died to save us all from our sins, and so we're already redeemed. But that doesn't alleviate the moral burden, weirdly mm -hmm. enough, because you'd think it should. So there's this paradox. And I think it's, I, I think part of the reason for that, this is, this is an extraordinarily complicated thing, but in, in, in the Brothers Karamazov, Christ comes back to earth. Right. And... Um, in Seville during the Spanish Inquisition. And so he's doing his miracles and raising people <coughs> from the dead and like being all messianic. And right. the first thing that happens is the inquisitor arrests him, right. throws him in prison, and then comes to visit him and basically says, look, um, the last thing we need after setting up this church for 2000 years is you. You're a lot of trouble. You've put a moral burden on human beings that's too much for them to bear. And so what we've done is watered it down and put some intermediaries in place so that the moral demand that your example required doesn't just crush people into nothingness, right? So every ideal is a judge. Right. So then you have the ultimate ideal. That's the ultimate judge. And from the inquisitor's point of view, that judge was too much. Mm -hmm. It was too right. demanding. And so... I think there's an, and so, so anyway, so the Inquisitor goes through all this argument and says, we're going to have to, you know, get rid of you again because right. you're, you're just too much to bear. Mm -hmm. And so Christ listens and doesn't, says any, doesn't say anything. And then just when the Inquisitor stands to leave, Christ kisses him on the lips and he, the Inquisitor mm -hmm. turns white in shock and then leaves, but he leaves the door open. And that's the brilliant, uh, that's the brilliant ending of of Dostoevsky's piece. The Grand Inquisitor, and, yeah. Yeah, and it, what makes him such a genius, because he basically says something like, well, look, the, the Catholic Church did reduce the burden, and it is corrupt in the way that earthly organizations are likely to be corrupt. And it does allow an out, which is, well, you can put your sins on Christ, let's say, and that alleviates your moral burden, but it still keeps the damn door open. Well, this and is... That's, so th this is why I think it's really fascinating, having, having spent a lot of time with Christian theologians in the past couple of years writing this book, is that the, the original conceit, I think, when, when, when you talk with people who are Christian and Jewish and you have sort of interfaith conversations, uh, the original one-sentence conceit and the difference between them is that what you hear from Jews is Judaism is acts-based and Christianity is faith-based. Christianity is about the acceptance of Christ. When you accept Christ, then you've accepted what you need to accept and everything flows therefrom. Mm -hmm. And Judaism says it's not just about accepting God, it's all these mitzvot, right? There are all these commandments that you have to do, and these are what perfect you as a human being. It's, it's the performance of these commandments, accepting God's sovereignty, because he's the one who gave the commandments, but you actually have to act in the world, and if you don't mm -hmm. act in the world, then you haven't fulfilled your responsibility in the world. Th and, this could also be an argument why you could have, although I know you wouldn't be thrilled them yeah. in per se, you could have Jewish atheists in that they believe that it's just their actions here. Yes, 100%. So, yeah. so th this is why you know Jews have had very, and, and I think most Christians believe this too, the idea of having a moral atheist is not really a difficult idea. Yeah. It's the idea of having a system built on atheism that's completely immoral and will fall apart almost immediately. And the idea of having a moral system built on atheism, if you examine your atheism closely enough, I think falls apart. I think that moral atheism is basically you separating your morality from your atheism and then ignoring your atheism in pursuit of the morality, which is, well, you can live fine that way, that's fine, but I don't think that that's psychologically sustainable um, in, if you actually examine the core of your ideas. But with that said, 
I think that Christianity, after its original millenarian viewpoint, when, when Christianity first came about, the idea of Christ on earth was that he had ushered in the messianic era because this was it was it was a new era it was a new day mm -hmm. and then it turns out that people looked around and went well this looks a lot like the old day right, right, not, right. not that much has changed mm -hmm. and so what changed what changed was our spiritual status that was the new redefinition of the messianic era is that the the what christ had brought to earth was a new spirit right he he yep. brought a new spirit into the earth and he he cleansed people of their sins and given them a fresh shot at life basically yep. uh, and that in doing so he changed the nature of of how things work well, Judaism basically said, well, we never thought that that nature changed in the first place, right? That's, that's, that's something different. And so, ironically enough, I think one of the sources of Christian anti-Semitism over time is an attempt to distinguish what makes Christianity different from Judaism other than Christ. Because Christianity and Judaism, in most of their main philosophies, have an awful lot in common. It's interesting. I just interviewed um, a, uh, a fellow named John MacArthur, who's a major pastor, major Christian theologian. I interviewed him a couple of days ago for our Sunday special. And this came up. I asked him, so where do you think the differences are between Christianity and Judaism? And he basically said, Jesus. Right? That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the mostly honest answer because when I hear Christian theologians try to distinguish Judaism from Christianity, what they say about Judaism I find to be not accurate as to what Judaism is actually says, and when I hear Jews try to distinguish Christianity from Judaism, I think that, well, and I'm not saying they're the same thing, mm -hmm. because they're not, obviously, they're different belief systems, but in terms of the underlying value system, the reason that we say Judeo-Christian value system is because in terms of the value system itself, the commonalities are overwhelming. They're overwhelming. The differences are mostly doctrinal and historical, and in terms of what you think, God, I, I think that Christians read back in an Acts-based version of their own lives through a variety of mechanisms, whether they say, well, predestination exists, but in order to show that if I were really elect, I would be acting this way, right? That is an acts-based version. It's just retroactive mm -hmm. from the end. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why if you say to a Christian, so you really believe that you can lead a terribly dissolute, awful, terrible life, but if you believe in Christ with the full fiber of your being, you're going to heaven? And they'll See, say, well, the, and, and many of them will say, yes, but then you say, but what makes a good person? And they'll say, right, not, but if, uh, right, what they'll always add, but if you believe in Christ, you wouldn't do all those things. Mm -hmm. Well, right? that's, that's the thing. Well, that, and that's why people are always criticizing me when I give an answer to the question that you just asked, because my, my answer has been, well, I act as if God exists. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's kind of Weasley. It's like, no, it's not, because it gets to the, to the core of this, what do you mean by believe? Well, do you, you believe in Christ? Well, does that mean you utter the words that he existed? Well, that's a pretty shallow form of belief. In fact, I think that's no form of belief at all. In mm -hmm. fact, it says in the New Testament, Christ himself says is something along the lines of, not all those who utter the words, Lord, Lord, will be saved. Right, and so, and Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity, doctrinal Christianity, was basically based on the idea that Christianity had taken the easy route out by insisting upon the statement of faith rather than the embodiment of the belief in action, which would be the imitation of Christ. Which, by the way, is Jesus' original criticism of Judaism, right? Is that everybody takes the, the commandments extraordinarily seriously, but they don't take the spirit of the commandments seriously. Yes, exactly. Enough, That's right? right. That's exactly right. It is the same. It's, it's the same thing. And so, you know, Nietzsche's criticism of Christianity was that there were very few real Christians because they didn't take on the burden of the action. And I would say it's the belief is actually manifested in the burden of the action. Now, you might want to say, you might want to be in a position, if you were a Christian, to say, well, my explicit statements of belief match what I act out, because right. maybe there'd be a unity in that. But the fundamental issue is what you, is what, the belief is manifested in what you do, because that's what you stake. For me, belief is what you stake your life on. Mm -hmm. That's belief. Right. And you stake your life on what you act out. And so you're trying to act out the idea that, well, that you take, I think that you take on the suffering of the world and the malevolence it's, of the world as your responsibility. You know, and, what's really fascinating well, is I think that what this comes down to, a lot of this debate comes down to which, from which end you're teaching. I think that it's, it's almost two sides of one coin. And if you're talking to a bunch of people who are not religious, who don't believe in the Bible, right? You're talking to an adult who looks at the Bible and says, I don't believe all of these ridiculous miracles happen. Why should I bother engaging? Why, why should I believe all this stuff? And my argument has always been because you do believe all this stuff, you're just pretending that you don't in the sense that you don't care about the historical circumstance, but all the things that you're acting out in daily life. I said this to Sam, right, mm -hmm, on stage, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, is, is that, you know, you and I hold 95% of the same values. Where do you think those came from? Mm -hmm. And Sam said, well, you know, I've done a lot of studying, a lot of research, but that doesn't explain why you and I hold 95% of the same values, because right. I haven't done any of those things, right? I didn't spend any time studying the, the philosophies of the East. 
The reason we hold 95% of the same values is because you grew up in a Judeo-Christian civilization with 3,000 years of common history. That's why we share the same value system. You didn't and eat mushrooms are, in a, on a river in Brazil? Exactly. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and somehow we end up in pretty much the same place about what we think is actually important in life and which liberties are important and all this stuff. And we have disagreements around the edges. But this is the West, right? This is, the West is different. It is not the same as other philosophies. And so when I'm talking to people about that, the case that I'm making is you are part of this great river of history. You can pretend you're not part of that great river. You can pretend you're not living off the fumes of that river. You are living, uh, you, you, you can pretend that the gas tank is running on its own. It ain't, okay? You, there is a, there's a deposit of fuel, so and you are is, still living this, off that. That's, but, and, but that is a different thing than what you teach a child. And this is where I think that, that things become different. Because I think that your philosophy, Jordan, is self-sustaining to a group of people who are looking at, re, at the values they live and saying, where did these come from and how do I justify these values? But I think that it would be very difficult to teach child values before you teach the myth. So I think that right. you're, you're coming at people and saying to them, your values can be justified by the myth. Yeah. But when you're teaching a child values, it's a myth. You have it's to teach. It, you have to keep, teach the kids the story first, of course, and then come the values. Yes. And so, the, and so there's a difference between. And this is they why, won't even listen unless you teach the story exactly. first. Exactly. Yeah. And this is why, as a religious person, I teach my kids the stories first because this, the values are embedded in the stories. And. Would I, do I have questions about the stories? What rational person wouldn't have questions about the stories? Of course you have questions about the reality or the historicity of the stories. That doesn't undercut, number one, the importance of the stories. And number two, the point is that you have to believe the fundamental assumptions embedded in the stories whether or uh, in order for the values to in order for the well, values and to and that, funny. that's exactly why you said before that the enlightenment couldn't have just sprung out of nothing right i mean that's that's exactly what you were saying that it needed all of the bedrock well and i would that. think that for people who are fundamental evolutionary biologists and i kept trying to make this case to well you can make a case like that to pinker and the psychologist but also to harris it's like what do you get where do you guys get off thinking that this is a consequence of the last 300 400 years right it's like we're, we're looking at time spans even the Enlightenment figures, they lived in a world that was like 6,000 years old. We're living in a world that's three and a half billion years old. You have to extend your thinking about the origins of, of phenomena like, like morality way, past, way back past the Enlightenment. And so this adventure thing, this is a good example of, of the wisdom that's embedded in those myths. So like, I didn't know that much. And, about I, and I will say, sorry, to just pause for a second. Yeah. And I would say in that history, specifically because... As a point of belief, I do believe that this is a historical circumstance. Uh, and whether you call it myth or history, as long as you believe the reality of myth, and you and I believe in reality in different ways, mm -hmm. and this is part of the fundamental distinction, because my understanding is that your understanding of what is true and what is real is uh, an almost a quasi-utilitarian Charles Peirce view, of because of, uh, you recommended me the book. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. and, but my, my view is much more like Sam's in the sense that most religious people believe the objective truth about historical myth. Right? Yeah. But, when it comes to getting beyond that question, then I think we're in almost well, complete what, agreement. Well, the, the, the strange thing is, too, with these mythological stories, is that like there are forms of abstraction that are more true than than what they're abstracted from, right? My mathematics is like that, and I'm going to do a bunch of lectures on Exodus, and I think the mosaic story is a really interesting example of that. It's like, what a good piece of... Here's a kind of truth. This is literary truth. And it's true, is that... Well, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and there was a pattern about what happened. Let's call that the heroic pattern, for lack of a better word. And so the question is, well, what's the reality? Is the reality the specifics of what happened mm -hmm. in each person's individual life, or is it the general pattern that manifested itself across all those people? And I would say, if you want to extract out guidelines for proper living, then the reality is the abstraction that's, that's, that's pulled out of the multiple stories. And so even if the story of Moses is a composite story in some sense, that doesn't mean it's not true. It's true the way, and this is something that, that I could never make headway with with regards to Sam. It's like, well, is there literary truth? Well, there better be, because otherwise, what is the use of literature, and how do you rank order literature in terms of quality if there's no standard of truth? Well, what's the truth? Well, it's an abstraction. And if you don't think that abstractions are true, then you're not thinking, because you can easily make a case that a proper abstraction is more real than the thing from which it's abstracted. You certainly make that case with mathematics. And so these stories, it's not only that they have pragmatic utility, although I try to explain things biologically when I can do that, it's that that utility is true in the broader sense that we've been describing truth. And so this, the Abrahamic story with the call to adventure is very interesting. So. Um, 
And it's something else that I've been lecturing to my audiences about. It's, well, what's the purpose of life? Well, it's an adventure. Well, where do you see that? Well, you see that in the Abrahamic story in particular, because Abraham's this guy who's fa who fails to launch, right? He's 80, and he's still in his father's <laughs> tent, and God says, you know... <coughs> Get up. <laughs> well, and that's the call, right? What is that? You think, well, there's a call to adventure. Well, there is a call to adventure. Young men die without that call to adventure. That's what attracts them to ISIS, for God's sake, is the call to adventure, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you could say, well, that's warped and twisted in those individuals, because the society hasn't... Can canalized that into the proper channels, right? It hasn't given them a moral equivalent to war in William James terms. It hasn't called them out properly. But God calls out Abraham, and all that happens to Abraham to begin with is that he encounters a famine and a tyranny and a conspiracy to steal his wife. Like, it's a yep, bloody catastrophe. It. And you think, oh, I see. Well, it isn't that God is calling you out to happiness. He's calling right. you out to the great adventure of your life, right? And that comes along with the suffering and the burden and the malevolence and all of that. And so it's something grand and noble, like a, like a seafaring expedition on the high seas. It's not, it's not that impulsive, self-gratifying, immediate happiness that seems to be, what would you say, the obsession of our current culture. Yeah, so I'm glad you... It's a call to physical adventure that I think people are lacking right now, but uh -huh. I think it's also a call to spiritual adventure in the sense that you are supposed to see how your values stack up against reality. I mean, this is the, mm. the most famous story of Abraham. Well, the most famous story is the, is the sacrifice of, of Isaac. And in that story... My view of that story is that I've never found that story particularly puzzling. A lot of people find that story particularly puzzling because God's saying, you know, go sacrifice your son. But to me, what he's actually saying is the fundamental truth. That story is the fundamental truth of raising a child and committing mm. to something. Because what God is actually saying to Abraham is you have to put your child at risk of death to live for a certain set of values. And then Abraham right. has another, has enough faith to say, and I trust that God is not actually going to kill my child. But by committing to this set of values, I am in fact putting my child I, I, at risk of death. Because you're putting your child in the world. And, and, yes, that's right. And, and, that's and right. not only that, you're doing so on behalf of your family, you're doing so on behalf of, of, the, of your God, you're doing so on behalf of a, of a broader purpose. And by the way, this is what it means to be, I think, an emissary, a fighter and a soldier and an emissary for the West. I think this is true particularly you know, as a Jew. I think this has always been true of Jews because here's the reality. Every time I, so my son is born, eight days later we circumcise him. We take a baby and we pre-commit him and we say, this is going to be your life now. Your life is I am pre-committing you. This is me doing, you know, what Abraham did to Isaac. I am putting my child in more danger by circumcising him and making him a Jew than I would otherwise be because Jews are at a lot more danger in the, in the world than other people. It's a messy and, I'm, and, and, and But that's the point mm -hmm. is that I'm saying to my child, I pre-commit you to this struggle. I pre-commit you to the set of values and that mm -hmm. does put you at additional risk, but that's also what gives you meaning. And throughout Jewish history, sometimes God doesn't find the ram in the thicket, right? Sometimes there is no ram in the thicket. Sometimes mm -hmm. the kids die. Right. Okay, that is that is the reality of life, and it's also the reality of committing to any value system worth committing to. It's so mm -hmm. interesting, because mm -hmm. I don't know that I've heard you talk about this in the lectures, this specific issue through the, the biblical lens, but this is so consistent with everything else you talk about, about how to be a good parent, that you've got to let them well, you see, danger. well, you, 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 uh, when, when you were when you were talking about that, the image that came to my mind was Michelangelo's Pieta, because what happens with Mary is that she has foreknowledge that her right. son will be broken by the world, and yet she offers she offers him up to the world, and then you think, well, if if a parent is doing this in a moral manner, then you are offering up your children to be broken by the world in the service of God. That's a sacrifice to God. And if you're the proper parent, then you do sacrifice, you do sacrifice your children to God. Because what you want from them, for them, is to serve the highest possible value. If you love them, that's what you want. And, and that's a mortal burden for them. And well, that's perfect, perfectly illustrated. Because I think of the payada as the sort of the female equivalent of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, of course, Mary is, is integrally bound up with her son. And yet, and he's broken sort of at the peak of his power and beauty, all of that. And she has to accept that as part of the precondition of proper existence. And so there's a real sacrificial element there. And that is reflected in that story. And so, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's correct in that manner. And it's a very rough story. So, but teaching your children values is, in effect, sacrificing to the world in a way that they wouldn't if you weren't teaching them the values, but it's also what allows them to live a fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. In doing that, in pre-committing your child to values, this is one of the major problems that I have with the way that the left has, has rewritten parenting, 
This idea of parenting is that you're just supposed to let your kid rush out into the world without any preparation at all, without any pre-committed set of values, and discover the world on their own without anything. Now, it's one thing to say you shouldn't encounter danger. It's another thing to make everything inherently more dangerous by not preparing your child for the possibility of a world that requires values and meaning. Well, well by the way, we, we saw this at hand in Sweden where we, were, we weren't sure why there was so much support for everything that mm -hmm. you're doing in Sweden. And when the, we do this Q&A after where people are submitting questions you know, online and then I look through them as Jordan's doing his talk and then we answer questions. And 90% of the questions had to do with gender issues and a ton of them were about genderless kindergartens yeah. and the emasculation of the father and all of this stuff. And it's like, that's exactly well, what it, you're saying. You've given well, these kids well, it's also extremely it's, Well, world. it's also extremely interesting, following up on your line of reasoning, that, well, let's say you do decide, well, I'm gonna launch my children out into the world to let them discover everything by themselves. Well, so what happens is, well, the world becomes so terrifying that you have to protect them from everything because they don't have any, they don't have any autonomy. They don't have any, yeah. exactly. They don't have any discipline. They don't have any inbuilt values, all of that. And so the, the counter consequence of that maximal freedom, and I've seen this with people, they have two-year-old kids and they put no restraints on them whatsoever. They haven't taught the kid what no means. Like, and you can teach a kid yep. what no means very rapidly. So if you have a child that's learning to crawl, for example, and, you know, maybe they're going to go pull something heavy <coughs> off a shelf, all you have to do is grab them by the leg and hold them and, and say no over and over until they stop doing what they're doing and they'll usually cry. And so, you know, that's cruel. Okay, so you stop them. And then if you do that for a week, then all you have to do is say no, and they'll cry and stop, and then two weeks later, they won't cry, they'll just stop. Now, no is a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. Because no is the imposition of the patriarchy against that, <laughs> against that instinctive exploratory force. The noble force. savage, yeah. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> against the noble savage, right? So it's a big deal, no. So, but then, okay, but then, now, once your child has got that, you can leave them be. Because they can explore like mad. Yeah, that's first, right. first of all, you can stop them by saying no, and so that's really helpful because if they're going to do something dangerous, a word will do it. But second, kids are really smart. And what I learned with my kids was once you taught them that there were five things in the house they couldn't do, then they generalized from that and they figured out the pattern of the things they couldn't do, and then they wouldn't do them. And then you could leave them alone. They could well, be autonomous. And then parents would come over who didn't teach their kids mm -hmm. no and they would follow their two-year-old around like totalitarians 100% <laughs> of the time because they couldn't trust them to have any autonomy at all. Yep. So the consequence of that absolute lack of discipline is the necessity for constant supervision. And, and this is, it's, it's also one of the reasons why I have so much trouble with the way, you know, you speak of the genderless parenting aspect. It's one of the reasons I have so much trouble with all of this. This idea that kids, that everything is biologically pre-written and biologically determined, and that how you raise your children has no impact on how their future life goes is such asinine bullshit. I mean, sorry to put it that way, but it just is. I have two kids under five. It is absolute nonsense. So I told a story the other day on the radio, uh, or on my show, on the podcast, uh, about my son. So my son is two and a half years old and he is just a delightful human being, which means that if you were an adult, he'd be the worst person ever, right? Because, <laughs> because two-year-olds are savages. This is what they are. Uh, anybody who tells you that children are naturally good is totally full of it. Children are naturally innocent. Children are naturally not good. Children are naturally selfish and mean and brutal to each other. And then they're joyous, and then they're full mm -hmm. of joy, right? They, they, this is what they are. And so my son, he has an older sister, and his older sister loves sparkly things. It's just her thing. She's, she's a girl. Right? And she's very girly. And so she has all of these sparkly shoes lying around. And so my son decided that he wanted to go and put on his sister's sparkly shoes. And I went to him and I said, no, those, those are girl shoes. Ooh. I said, no, those are girl shoes. We don't wear those. And he, said, and he started to fuss. He said, no, he said I, want, I, want Lee, I, want, I won't say her name. I want her shoes. I want her shoes. And I said, those are girl things. And then I took him to the, out, the Western Outfitters over here in mm -hmm. Van Nuys. Yeah. And I got him a pair of cowboy boots. And he will not take off his cowboy boots. Now, the way the left would see that is that is me cruelly crushing his spirit. Perhaps he just wants to be a girl. Perhaps he wants to be raised in an effeminate manner. Yeah, except that by me giving him the choice, by going and getting him cowboy boots and then saying, here, here's some cowboy boots, and that's more gender appropriate, it turns out that that's what he likes. And you know what? Even if he didn't like that, he's two and a half years old. The amount I of get hate, to decide for him. The amount of hate that I'm going to get just for sitting here listening to you tell that story of right. how you parent. And he's I not, didn't push back on Shapiro, who but, didn't want his son to wear sparkly shoes, right. Ruben. He's not an adult. When he's 17, if he makes an affirmative case why he should wear sparkly shoes, yeah. go for it. Yeah. When he's two and a half, I'm the guy who gets to instill 
the system that I think will lead to his greatest happiness. I am the totalitarian in my own house. I am the king of my own house. And I get to determine whether I think my child will live a happier life struggling with the desire to wear sparkly shoes at age 25, or whether it might be better for him to be brought up in a situation where it's easier to choose in line with gender stereotyping that, by the way, is reflected over every human culture. The idea that gender stereotyping is unique to the West is absolute nonsense. There are differentiations between how we treat men and how we treat women in every culture mm -hmm. in the history of humanity. Yeah, well, that, again, is why the Sweden thing was yeah, so interesting well, to me, because we found out, basically, as, as you laid out, and feel free to clean this up, yeah. was that they've done egalitarianism right. Men and women have been equal for quite some mm -hmm. time, and yet still what has happened there is that more men are engineers and more women are nurses. Yeah, and the, that the is, men and women are more different. They're, they're still different. Right. Yeah. And, more and different. More different. Exactly, yeah. that's right. And yet the social justice warriors or, or whatever this thing is, they won't let them have the win. So they ran well, the experiment. Well, the other, the other issue here, too, is, well, imagine that, just hypothetically imagine that you were going to try to raise your children gender neutral. Okay, so there was actually studies done on this back 30 years ago where they looked at self-professed feminist parents and self-professed non-feminist president parents and then coded their interactions blindly for uh, gender stereotypical behavior and found no difference between the two groups. Huh. Well, and the reason for that is, you know, you think that you socialize your children entirely if you're a social constructionist. It's all top down, right, because your child's a blank slate, but your child isn't. Your child is manifesting to a greater or lesser degree all sorts of gendered behaviors and powerfully. And a lot of what you're doing, especially if you're a good parent, is you're reacting to what your child is manifesting as an individual. And so a lot of the socialization, that so-called the socialization, which sounds like top-down, is actually the establishment of, an, of a singular relationship between you as the parent and that individual child with their nature. And this is, this is also reflected in the behavioral genetics literature, because what you see is that... Imagine there's three sources of variation in children's behavior. There's biological, there's shared environment, so this would be the siblings, so this would be what was the same in the family for the siblings, mm -hmm. and then what was different. And then you look at <coughs> the behavioral outcome and you calculate how much was biological, how much was shared environment, and how much was non-shared environment. What you find is it's almost all biology and non-shared environment. And so people have read that to say, well, parents don't matter because there's no shared environment. But it's not the case because what happens is if you're a good parent is the relationship you have with child one is significantly different than the relationship mm -hmm. exactly that you have right. with child two. Even though there may be moral presumptions that are organizing your family the that are in you're common. treating your children identically are almost never. Right. Almost right. never. That's right. Well, I mean, why back would you... to Cain and Abel, right? I mean, but this, but this yes. is right. I mean, like if God is the parent figure in that story... Treating your children differentially is a way of being a good parent. That's if you right. treat your kids exactly the same, you're not being responsive to your kids, and you're teaching them that, that essentially there are no consequences to actions because your kids right, no take different actions, right? Do. No matter what, it's the same outcome. Well, that's, yes. that's not good parenting. Right, no, no, that, no that's, that's almost the definition of totalitarian parenting. <laughs> and it's exactly the kind of relationship that you don't want to have with anyone. Right, you want all of your relationships to be individualized and particularized. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, um, and so, the, so we, we, we radically underestimate the degree to which the gendered interactions between children and parents are driven by the children. So here's a funny experiment. There's some evidence that parents who drink more are more likely to have children with ADHD. Now, I'm not a big fan of ADHD diagnosis, but we'll leave that aside. Okay, so, so then there was some suggestion that maybe, well... ADHD is part of a genetic complex that involves alcoholism and antisocial personality because those things also clump together. And so there's various experiments done to see if that is the case. And there's a fair bit of diagnostic overlap between childhood conduct disorder and ADHD, so it's kind of messy. Irrelevant. Here's the experiment. You bring parents in to interact with children who aren't their own, and you, you have them do an alcohol taste test. And so the taste test is, well, here's rum and coke, and here's vodka and orange juice, and here's orange juice, and here's water. And uh, what we want you to do is to just rate the taste of each of these beverages, okay? And so then we expose you to some children. And one of the children is a child with a diagnosis of ADHD, and one of the ch child children is one that doesn't. And then, so you do that with a bunch of parents, and then you have them do the taste test. Okay. Well, you don't care what they rate the damn right, drinks. You right. just care how much they drink. Right. And it turns out that the parents that were exposed to the kids that have attention deficit disorder drink <laughs> far <course>. more. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's a good. It's a good example of the idea of bidirectionality and socialization. It's like you're not 
you have a relationship with your child. Now, you obviously enforce a certain degree of social norm if you're sensible, because you want your child to be socialized and desirable to other people. You want them to be able to play reciprocally, and you want them to be attentive enough to adults so that adults treat them well, so the world opens up to them, right? So that's what you're doing. But other than that, you're particularizing like mad, because to even to get that child to that end state requires a particularized path. You know, my daughter was intrinsically very cooperative, and my son was intrinsically very competitive. And so the pathway to getting them both to be reciprocal players was substantially different, exactly even right, though yeah. the, the desired outcome, and they became reciprocal players. Like, they, you know, they were, pop, they were popular kids who were in constant demand as playmates, which I think is the hallmark of successful parenting, by the way, by the time if your kids are four mm -hmm. and other kids really want to play with them, it's like, you did it, you got it right. And if, if they're not, then something's gone seriously wrong. But there's multiple pathways to that. So I'm glad we got this to the current day, because one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys about is what we're basically talking about here is living life with a certain set of rules. And we can whittle away whatever. 12 of them. Whatever, 12, 12 of them <laughs> usually 12 of them, although I hear there's going to be a couple there, more There coming, is. There's more coming. That's the rumor. God had time, um, so. Yeah, 10, 12, whatever it is. Um, but we, it seems to me we live in a time where, where the energy is just around the people that have no rules. So, you know, sort of as the Trump thing grew, it was this sort of destructive force. Break all that, the you things, know, yeah. That break all the things, right? And, and Eric and I talked about how Eric would have wanted, Eric Weinstein would have wanted a panther in a china shop, but I said, you just don't get that. You get the bull in the china mm. shop. That's how mm -hmm, it is. Mm -hmm. Now I see the energy behind sort of the SJW left and, and the new, that socialism is cool and, let, and that it's much easier to destroy than create. Do you think that the rules that you lay out in your book and the rules that you talk about from a biblical perspective and everything else, that people with rules can sort of survive in, in a crazy time like we're in now, where information travels that much faster and there's that much sort of entropy behind chaos that maybe there wasn't before because we couldn't transmit information so quickly. Do you think there's enough juice behind this, well, so I, I'm, I'm gonna disagree slightly with the premise of your yeah. question. I don't actually think that the left doesn't have rules. I think they have more rules than we do. I think that, that we have a certain basic set of rules and then an immense amount of freedom within these guardrails. I think the left, in getting rid of the guardrails, had to, because human beings cannot live without rules, the left Right, they love all sorts of different rules. No, but, I'll, but, I'll, but, but this, this is actually an important point. Yeah. They reversed engineered a set of extraordinarily complex rules that are arbitrarily applied. So you don't even know you violated a rule until after mm -hmm. you've tripped over the rule, right? Taboos. Now, they replaced rules with taboos. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and, and that is extraordinarily dangerous. So that the energy is behind seeking a new set of rules. The question is, can we defend our rules mm -hmm. in such a way that it is attractive to people. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll more, accept. I'll accept right. this. Well, and I think uh, I think you do that. I think you do that fundamentally by pointing out the relationship between rules and aspiration. It's like agreed. the rules define a value hierarchy, and then that gives you something noble to do. That's your call to adventure. Exactly. And so the rules don't constrain. They do constrain you. Obviously, rules right. constrain. But at the same time, they constrain. They provide an organizing framework and a direction, and that's and you need and, and that that direction isn't optional because the other thing yeah, that no, I've... rules are like pants okay you put them on and they're fundamentally constraining but they allow you to walk through brambles <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> mm, right well that's well that's also why when you see that one of the first things that happens in the garden of eden when adam and eve become self-conscious is they put on clothing exactly right it's a constraint and a protection at the same time and, and culture is always that it's constraint and protection at the same time and the, and the radical types are always going oh you know oh the constraint oh the constraint and fair enough right because there's that tyrannical aspect but the the protection and the aspiration are of absolutely critical importance and i don't think there is a more i don't think that we've laid out anywhere a more noble orientation with regards to disciplined aspiration than that that's encoded inside the Judeo-Christian ethic, and that that is the core of the Enlightenment, and that is... Right. Okay, so I have another question about Judaism. Okay, that, sure. Okay, so one of the things that I would... that I've always wondered about is... I think one of the things that distinguishes Christianity from Judaism is that Judaism has an implicit emphasis on the salvation... on the, sal on the salvific properties of the state. And I don't think you see that in Christianity to the same degree. So, I mean, because there's... Can you there's, explain that a little well, further? Yeah. Well, there's the, there's the idea of Israel. No, this is, this that, is, this that's is part right. of it. Yeah. And, and there's the idea of the Jewish nation as a people, mm -hmm. right? Whereas Christianity has this universalism that's, right. that's it, built it, into it. This is right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, 
And this, so, is fun, this is a fundamental distinction. Okay, so, okay, so, yeah. so, and this is, I've never been able to have this conversation with anyone because it's an unbelievably dangerous conversation. But it seems to me that, it seems to me that the advantage of Christianity is that it places the fundamental locale for salvation within the individual. I mean, independently mm -hmm. of whether it's, like, pushed off for reasons of mercy onto Christ, right. which is something else we didn't finish discussing, is one of Jung's points with regards to Christianity and Catholicism was that there was a merciful element to it because the burden that was placed on each person being the locus of, of redemption, let's say, was so heavy that it was unbearable. Right. And so that you needed an intermediary structure to, like, lift the load off you from time mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. time, which is what the Catholics do. It's like, well, here's all the ways that I've failed. That's okay. You're fallible. You're a fallible human being. You don't have to be crushed into absolute dust by the fact that you're not everything you should be. So, all right, but anyways... The, I think that's the, where Jewish guilt kicks in, if I'm not mistaken. Well, and it, it's also, I think, to some degree where Protestant guilt kicks in because the Catholics have that out. Right. And you can be cynical about that, right? Say, well, you sin your whole life and then on your deathbed you're converted. It's like, well, that's all nonsense right. because you actually have to repent. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a lifetime of sin, there's going to be a little <laughs> bit of hell <laughs> associated. That's yeah, right. That's up. right. But you can see the mercy in that, in, that, in that Catholic approach because it gives you like a reset in some sense, right? You get to be washed the fact that you're not everything you could be is a terrible burden. Right. And if you're carrying that all the time, it can just crush you into nothing. And, and, and obviously that's, that's present in its earlier iteration in the, in the sacrificial system in the temple among Jews uh, or among the... I mean, like I say in uh, three times a day, you say a portion in the Shemona Asrei, in the silent prayer, uh, in which you repent your sins. Mm -hmm. And then we have a full day, right? Yom Kippur is deliberately designed to do that and to try and wipe the slate clean and give right, you a fresh right, start. Right, right, um, right. But right. as far as the, the other question that you're asking yeah, about... Yeah, the state, the, the individual. Right, so it, to me, it's less about the state per se, because when you're talking about the nation of Israel, Am Yisrael in the, in the actual biblical parlance, it's not talking about like a bordered state and, and corporate salvation within that. It's about the special responsibility of this group of people to to spread light to the world, right? That you're supposed to be in the, again, Hebrew phrase, I'm using a lot of Hebrew today, but we're talking Bible, so we're yep. okay. Yeah. Uh, is that you're supposed to be a mamlechet kohan and begoy kadosh, meaning that you're supposed to be a nation of priests um, and, and a holy nation. Uh, and so that idea uh, was expanded by Christianity to all of hum all of humanity corporately. That, that basically, right. this, this applies equally to all humans. Now, what's interesting about Judaism is that Judaism actually has almost a two-track approach. So if you are a Jew, then you have these responsibilities, these 613 mitzvot. You are not barred from the afterlife or from decency if you're not a Jew. So Judaism is only half exclusive in the sense that if you're a Jew, you're a Jew, and if you're not a Jew, we try to actually dissuade you from becoming one. But if you are a, but if you are outside the Jewish nation, you have a share in the afterlife so long as you fulfill seven basic commandments, the commandments of Noah, right? So there's a set of seven commandments that were given to Noah. These are basic, basic things. Don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't eat the flesh of a living animal, uh, don't, you have to create courts of justice. Uh, th these are like all very, very basic laws. And so what that means is that Judaism posits, the, Yorm Hazoni is a really interesting philosopher from Israel. He has a new book out called The Case for Nationalism. Oh, yeah, and essentially, we're, we're getting him on. Yeah, it's really, mm. it's really interesting. Mm. And basically, the case that he makes is that the biblical Jewish view of where values should be embedded at the maximal level is a safer view than the universalist conception. Because the universalist conception that you have a set of values that applies equally to everyone across all times and cultures actually leads to tyranny and cramdowns, meaning that his argument is that the threat of the 20th century was not a bunch of nationalisms that were embedding particular values. It was certain nationalisms that wanted to become universalisms. It was Germany wanting to be the Reich that ruled the entire world, or the USSR wanting to be a country that was able to apply communism across all times and all places. So a certain level of particularism in how we apply basic rules, the seven laws of Noah in the biblical case, or the Ten Commandments, you can have certain cultural differentiations and that allows for group cohesion mm -hmm. and in a way that you can't with the great mass of humanity. Right. Because well, that's how many... a Tower of Babel problem, right? right. If, it, if you expand the, if you expand it, the corpus exactly right. to, to be too large, then it starts to become too complex in its exactly. structure and too totalitarian. Exactly. Right? So, so the Jewish critique of, of the universalistic principle would be, yes, there are certain fundamental universal principles that we should all hold by, and those we hold have to keep by Jews and non-Jews alike. But how those are iterated, they have to be iterated within a specific cultural structure. Otherwise, what you end up with is people trying to cram down cultural 
hallmarks of those structures on everybody else. And totalitarianism springs from the idea that I'm going to take my culture, which is different, not actually better, right? Like we don't actually say that the 613 commandments are necessary for everyone. They are, they are not necessary for people who are not Jewish. And to take that and say, okay, now everyone has to abide by those things would be a form of totalitarianism okay. Okay. in so, a way that, that okay. it is not so, when you say we have this particular set of values that is iterated to us in a particular way. Okay, but maybe we could, maybe we could think about it this way. Maybe that would include both sides, is that there's a danger to claims of universalism, and that's that large-scale totalitarian mm -hmm. utopianism. And maybe you could, you could criticize the universalism of Christianity as contributing to that from a conceptual perspective. But maybe you could say the same thing about the concentration on the particular on the side of the, uh, of the Jewish emphasis on, on the state. And that because there are obviously pathologies of ethno-nationalism and localization that, sure. that also manifest themselves as another kind of danger, right? It would be the danger of too much exclusion and the danger of not enough exclusion. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the issue is how you get the relationship between the individual and the correct. Per correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things that I think the EU is really struggling with is because, you know, I'm kind of oddly enough for someone who's a universalist, let's say, I'm somewhat um, sympathetic to the claims of the nationalists in the European Union, because it seems to me that what they're complaining about is that as sovereign individuals, there have been <coughs> levels of bureaucracy laid out in this huge overarching structure, the EU, that divorce them as individuals from mm -hmm. their masters, mm -hmm. right? And they want a local structure so that they have some relationship with the structure. Right. And maybe you see in a place... And like, localism, by the way, with other human beings. I mean, the fact right. is that it, you, if you didn't value your own child more than you valued the child of a stranger, this would probably make you a bad person. Right. Right. Like we would actually right, it would, consider it you would. a bad person. Like if, yes, if, if, if you had the choice between saving, if I had the choice between saving my son and saving a random kid of the same age, and I said, you know, I don't see any difference between <laughs> yeah. these two things. Right. This would make me a bad person. So the idea of having societal bonds that are local in nature is one of the things that America got right in, in its original yes. federal structure is the idea of localism. Localism is very important as opposed to one set of rules for everybody because we do have these variations and those variations allow us to have the social fabric that's necessary. You can't, yes. this is actually where I mean, to bring it full circle back to the online stuff, the online world is a giant savanna. It is just one huge plane, right? There's no hierarchy in the online world. Mm -hmm. And not only that, there are no pockets in the online world on Twitter. It's just one huge plane. That doesn't generate any feeling of community. What generates a feeling of community is people who you actually have social ties with. And those social mm -hmm. ties are necessary. Social fabric cannot exist for six billion or seven billion human beings. Social fabric exists in your community, mm -hmm. right? And as large as that community can grow. And there are limits to the growth of that community. And maybe this is what both Christianity and Judaism have in common when it talks about the Messianic era, is there will be a time when that social fabric can, in fact, encompass everybody. Mm -hmm. But that's not something that, that happens still, naturally. Well, and it, right? it might also still be that it's still full of particularities. Exactly. Right? It's just that the, the particularities the have to be, have to be, Properly within a context, organized, yes. within a context, right? We like the right. EU in the sense that they have a certain set of social values, and as those social values disappear, we like the EU less. But those social values have to be in common, right? So we all have to have those in common. Yes. But the French don't want to be English. The English don't want to be French, and that's perfectly okay. They don't have to be French. Well, it's kind of nice that there are French and English. Like yeah, that, right. that's exactly. part of the, yeah. the that's part of the upside of diversity. Let's say is that there is some genuine diversity, and that localism preserves that diversity. And this as is what's well. so funny about the left, right? The left will say that diversity is our is our greatest benefit, and then they immediately try to wash away everything that is diverse about how people behave, except for. Except basic, for the biological, biological, know, right? Right? It's, it's so funny. Right. Well, then so at, funny. at the same time, they'll also say, well, we should be more like countries like Sweden and Norway and Finland and blah, blah, blah. Some of the most homogenous countries we, on planet Earth, right? I mean, like... Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, there were plenty of people there who were very worried about the directions that their countries are going. Well, Sweden and, so and Norway are both... we got all these lefties in America saying, oh, it's so great over there. And the amount of people that we met there that are completely... Uh, also, afraid of saying anything. Well, Sweden, yeah. Sweden, Sweden Norway, and Denmark yeah. are immigration restrictionist countries. It's so funny. The left will talk about the wonders. Well, of these Sweden countries. is now right, but because of the backlash, right? Yeah. Because of the backlash to massive Islamic immigration into Sweden and the and the fracturing of society in areas like Malmo. Right? That's why all the Jews are leaving Sweden, yeah. and Sweden has elected a, a center right government specifically on the immigration issue. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, to to ignore, um, yeah, for for me, uh, individually and collectively. Um, the biggest source of unhappiness for people is pretending that reality isn't reality. When people fight reality, they lose. And recognizing that reality is reality is, is necessary, whether you're a nation like Sweden 
or whether you are an individual who's struggling with certain realities. Like people's unhappiness springs from thinking that reality is mutable, but they are immutable. Mostly, you're immutable and reality is not mutable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I got I got one more for you guys because we only okay. got about ten minutes. Okay. So let's go deep and personal with the theme that we've run with here. I want to know a little bit about the adventure you're both on. We we I've been on this adventure with you at least for the last couple <laughs> of months. Um, but we, I've asked you this before a couple of times, and and you always give me a slightly different answer. Where does it come from within you that you can do this? And that's what I want to ask you too. Like, where does it come from that you? You, sure, you can know all these things, you can say all these things, you can read about all these things, but that you, Jordan Peterson, can get out there every day, put your ass on the line, take all the hate, keep going. What, what is it about you? Well, the first thing that we should point out is that, you know, I have the same experience that Ben has in public. It's like I've had one negative interaction in public, and it was minor, and it was in Dublin with a woman who was really drunk. <laughs> so, so we're going to not count that. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't even that bad, you know, but, but I've had thousands of personal interactions with people, and they're all unbelievably positive. They're not just positive. Like, they're, people approach me, and they're very polite, and they're often apologetic because they think they're interrupting me. And... Um, you know, then we have a brief personal conversation and they talk about how while well, they've been reading or listening or whatever and that their lives are straightening out and that that's really good and that they've recommended the book and, and so I'm very happy about that and but it's just 100% positive. And so and that and it's an amazing and uplifting thing to be able to go all over the world like I was in Slovenia a week ago. Uh, I think the effect of YouTube, by the way, I think the effect of YouTube is, and podcasts is even bigger in places where the media isn't as reliable or well-developed as it is in the West. It's hard to say how, how huge uh, an, an effect it has, but it's unbelievably big. And so people were stopping me all over. And, and it's a remarkable thing to go into a new city and have complete strangers approach you in the most positive possible way, and then to tell you something private about their lives, and then to share with you some triumph they've had. It's like... That, there's nothing that can be better than that. And then when we do these lectures, it's that en masse, right? Yeah. We have like 1,000, 2,000 people come to the auditoriums and very little of what we've been discussing has been political, except, yeah, that's the, thing. Well, except the way we've been discussing pol politics, you know. The, the, on a the, general uh, level with ramifications. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as a variant of philosophical things. orientation, say, yeah. but it's almost all centered on individual development. And so it's, it provides a kind of energy like in the, and, and then I've been in a more and more fortunate position over the last nine months because although I still find it very stressful to have contentious interviews with journalists like the GQ interview, for example, um, they have their advantages. You know, it's, it's, it's not like they're a net loss in terms of promoting what I'm trying to do, which is to try to help individuals fortify themselves. And then so all of the elements of this that are positive is enough to sustain this and, and to enable it to continue and, and to also make me think that there isn't anything more relevant or meaningful or adventurous that I could possibly be so doing. So it's feeding the meaning at the same time. Oh, that's definitely, what, that's absolutely. That's what I'm finding through this is like it, every night that we're out there, there's this like renewed sense of, wow, this is real. Mm. It's not just we're no, putting it up and let it go to the universe. It's like we're seeing these people. Mm. And when that guy, we almost took off late from one flight when that guy that was working at the airline came up to you right in the front row and was going on and on and he could barely speak. Yeah. And it was like, holy Well, God, and you have people, real. you know, they say, well, my, my girlfriend and I decided to get married. Now we're having a yep. baby because we've listened to your lectures. Or here's, here I'm here with my father and we put our relationship, that happened. The like, father and son who, had, who literally hadn't seen each other, I think they said seven years yep. and they came to the yep. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were all smiling away. And like, and there's just endless stories like that. And I believe, well, I believe two things. I believe that... The individual is the fundamental loc locus of salvation and redemption. I truly believe that. I don't think there's anything that's more true than that. And then every time I see someone who's put themselves together, I think that's one more major victory, not minor, you know, yep. which is also why I'm always talking to individuals in the audience. And when what we do these meet and greets afterwards, which kind of have this commercial cheesiness about them, you know, but, but I don't care about that because that's how it's, it, that's how it, it is. That's, it that's is. how it has to be. Yeah. It's, it, and it's set up so that it works. I meet 150 people and I'm very careful with every single person that I interact with. And the reason for that is because I'm absolutely thrilled that they're there. You know, they're there, they're there because they are trying to 
not make things worse, minimally, right? And so, you know, one of the themes that we've been discussing in these lectures continually is that not only do you have a moral obligation to aim up and be good, like and to, to pick the highest value that you can conceive of and pursue that honestly, but that if you don't do that to the degree that you fail, something that's hellish takes that space. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. Like, I believed that since 19... 87 when I was studying totalitarianism I realized that it was the abdication of individual responsibility in the final analysis that led to the horrors of Nazi Germany and the totalitarian communist states it was on us each of us and so I thought well then the thing to do about that is to do whatever you can to strengthen individuals and to make them more more like appropriate moral agents not rights not the individual rights but the individual responsibility and I I truly believe that that's how you keep hell at bay. And so there's a lot, because I really believe that, there's a lot of energy in that. It's yeah. like, I'm not interested in having a replication of what happened in the 20th century. Like, enough of that, enough. And so if, if with each person that's on a better path, that, that probability decreases by one seven billionth, then so be it. And I think the effect is much larger than that. Because oh, I, I think, think it's a network effect. I, I don't think, I mean, this is what I was saying to you right before we started. I don't think we can really understand how big it is because now there's lectures, you're doing your show live, I'm doing stand-up, Rogan's doing his thing, Sam's doing all these things. And it's not just about us. I don't want to make it just about us. But that there is some other energy. So when I talk about the, the energy of destruction that's out there, I think there is a great energy no, in I, creation, I, and I think we're part of it. I don't know how you're going to top that answer. No, I'm not. So. I'm just going to do a short form, which is, I, it, it's, it's fascinating. So I go out in public, as I say, and a lot of people want to take pictures, and I'm sure Jordan gets it as much or more than I do. Uh, and when you do that, it's you always hear from people, yeah, you know, I met this celebrity on the street, and they were just such a jerk, right? Like, <laughs> I, I met an actor, and the actor was, like, miffed that they had to get up from dinner. Yeah. I have never felt the experience where somebody wanted to take a picture, and I was not delighted that they wanted yeah. to take a picture. And I think the reason for that is not because, like, oh, look at me, I get to be in this random person's picture that he puts on his wall, but because if you actually believe that what you're doing is a reflection of values that matter, it's not that they're engaging with me, mm -hmm. right? It's that they're engaging with the ideas that I, am, that I am stating, yeah. and that's unbelievably exciting, that's that I've right. dedicated cool. my entire cool. life to espousing a certain set of values, and now millions of people are engaging with those values and finding those values meaningful. This is why I, it's hard for all of us not to sound arrogant because we take our values so seriously, so when we say that maybe the hope for the country lies in the fact that there are so many people who actually watch stuff like this, I don't mean that because I care if people, if people were watching me face paint you know, then I don't think that that would have any meaning for me. But the fact that people watch my show and that they're getting some semblance of truth and values out of it, and what's, it, it, I will say, it is weirder for me. I think it's probably weirder for me than it is for you, Jordan, because you talk so much about self-help and about individual help and all, all this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm a, pl a politics guy and I spend most of my day breaking down current events, the fact that I get so many people who email me, and I send them to my wife, I send them to my, my parents, because this is the stuff I'm actually the proudest of, is when I get emails from people, and I got one today from some guy who said, yeah, I knocked up my girlfriend and I didn't know what to do about it. And then I started listening to your show and I realized that for me to be a better and more responsible human being, I needed to marry my girlfriend. And we've been married now for three years. And my, she was thinking about getting an abortion. I listened to your show. She didn't get an abortion. Now we have a kid. And it's just an amazing, amazing thing. Like that's the stuff that I care about. I think politics, what I do for a living, the politics, that's the stuff that's existing on top of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And what I hope I'm doing is talking about this in a sense that allows people to draw a straight line down to the bottom of the iceberg and say, okay, well, the real important stuff is not what's happening in the Mueller investigation up here. It's what's happening in terms of truth and decency and waiting for available evidence down here, to take one example. Uh, and so every news story is supposed to tie down into the rootedness of a value system. And the fact that people are hungry for those values, that is what I'm really excited about. Oh, yeah, that's, no. a, that's absolutely... Well, like, you know, I mentioned earlier that the tendency of the audience is to go silent when I talk about the relationship between meaning and responsibility. And that's, well, that's a sustaining thing. It's like, look, there's all these thousands of people. And what are they starving for? A heavy moral burden. This yeah. is right. That's right. so they're, amazing. They're it's paying like, money. Yeah. They're paying yeah. sometimes 150 well, uh, bucks a ticket. Uh, what are the well, look, I To think hear someone say... Fix yourself. Yeah, don't think, don't know, buy my shit. Don't. I'm not hawking anything. You know, there's a book, but like, yeah. but it's like, it's on you. Yeah, it's on you. Get going. It's on you. This, yeah. is, it's on but you. This, yeah. this is the reality of the backlash because for thousands of years, it was the religious community saying, "You have responsibility. You have duty. You have responsibility. You have duty." And then over the last 150 years, people went, "No, we're not going to do any of that stuff." You know what? Forget it. And now people are going, 
you know, that has some upside, but it also has an awful lot of downside. Mm -hmm. And we, none of us are theocrats in the room. I don't want a religiously oriented society where there's some king up top who's telling everybody what to do, far from it. But people are hungry for a set of eternal values. Yeah. And if they don't get those eternal values, they will find something else to fill the hole. And yes. It will be anger, or it will be drugs, or it will be hedonism, or it will be selfishness. And, or it'll be ideology. Or ideology. Mm -hmm. And all of these things. And, and I am an ideologue because my ideology is my values. But it'll be political ideology. It'll be political tribalism. It'll be race-based stuff. It'll be ethnic mm -hmm. ethnocentricity. Mm -hmm. It'll be all those things. What we're doing by promoting a set of, of values that, that matter is we are allowing people to, to not only keep the chaos at bay, but, but find a path amidst the chaos. You know, Viktor Frankl says in Man's Search for Meaning that in the middle of the Holocaust, what kept certain people alive and why did certain people die? He said, because if you were in the middle of the Holocaust living in a death camp, it was the people who found some sense of purpose in the death camp who actually got to live. And how can you find purpose in the most purposeless place in the history of humankind? Mm -hmm. He said, it didn't matter. If human beings can find meaning living in, a, li living in a concentration camp where people are getting gassed to death every day, then you certainly should be able to find meaning in the freest, most rich, most prosperous human society right, in the history right, of humanity. Right, right, right. That, Shapiro, is how you end it. I will add that I like when people come up to me too. Of course, Ben knows this. There's a girl who works at the hardware store that's only a few blocks away from here who always says to me, Dave, I'm a big fan of yours, but I really like that Ben Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I will be, well, thanks to both of you guys. Yeah, of course. Thanks, I gotta grow a beard next time. So uh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, the, you're the religious guy I know, here. Right? You have the beard? <laughs> um, I will be at the Orpheum with Jordan on, there can't be any tickets left, right, for the LA no. show Saturday, no. but you maybe can get them on StubHub or something like that. And perhaps a certain Orthodox Jew will show up because it's after Shabbat, you never know. See if I can convince my Anything wife. Anything yeah. is possible. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for watching.